Chapter One of the Song of the Cardinal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Song of the Cardinal by Jean Stratton Porter. Chapter One. Good cheer, good cheer, exulted the Cardinal. He darted through the orange orchard searching for slugs for his breakfast, and in between whiles he rocked on the branches and rang over his message of encouragement to men. The song of the cardinal was overflowing with joy, for this was his holiday, his playtime. The southern world was filled with brilliant sunshine, gaudy flowers, an abundance of fruit, myriads of insects, and never a thing to do except to bathe, feast, and be happy. No wonder his song was a prophecy of good cheer for the future, for happiness made up the whole of his past. The cardinal was only a yearling, yet his crest flared high, his beard was crisp and black, and he was a very prodigy in size and coloring. Fathers of his family that had accomplished many migrations appeared small beside him, and coats that had been shed season after season seemed dull compared with his. It was as if a pulsing heart of flame passed by when he came winging through the orchard. Last season the cardinal had piped his shell away to the north in that paradise of the birds the limber lost. There thousands of acres of black marsh muck stretch under summer's sun and winter's snows. There are darksome pools of murky water, bits of swale and high morris. Giants of the forest reach skyward or coated with velvet slime, lie decaying in sun-flecked pools, while the underbrush is almost impenetrable. The swamp resembles a big dining table for the birds. Wild grapevines clamber to the top of the highest trees, spreading umbrella-wise over the branches, and their festooned floating trailers wave as a silken fringe in the play of the wind. The birds loll in the shade, peel bark, gather dried curlers for nest material, and feast on the pungent fruit. They chatter in swarms over the wild cherry trees and overload their crops with red haws, wild plums, papas, blackberries, and mandrake. The alders around the edge draw flocks in search of berries, and the marsh grasses and weeds are weighted with seed hunters. The muck is alive with worms, and the whole wasp ablaze with flowers whose colors and perfumes attract myriads of insects and butterflies. Wild creepers flaunt their red and gold from the treetops, and the bumblebees and hummingbirds make common cause in rifling the honey-laden trumpets. The air around the wild plum and red haw trees is vibrant with the beating wings of millions of wild bees, and the bee birds feast to gluttony. The fetid odors of the swamp draw insects in swarms, and flycatchers tumble and twist in air in pursuit of them. Every hollow tree homes its colony of bats. Snakes sun on the bushes. The water folk leave trails of shining ripples in their wake as they cross the lagoons. Turtles waddle clumsily from the logs. Frogs take graceful leaps from pool to pool. Everything native to that section of the country underground, creeping, or a wing can be found in the Limberloss, but above all the birds. Dainty green warblers nest in its treetops, and red-eyed vireos choose a location below. It is the home of bellbirds, finches, and thrushes. There are flocks of blackbirds, grackles, and crows. Jays and catbirds quarrel constantly, and marsh wrens keep up their never-ending chatter. Orioles swing in their pendant purses from the branches, and with the tanagers picnic on mulberries and insects. In the evening, nighthawks dart on silent wing. Whippoorwills set up a plaintive cry that they continue far into the night, and owls revel in moonlight and rich hunting. At dawn, robins wake the echoes of each new day with the abomination. Cheer up! Cheer up! and a little later big black vultures go wheeling through the cloudland or hang there like frozen splashes searching the lumberlost 
and the surrounding country for food. The boom of the bittern resounds all day, and above it the rasping scream of the blue heron, as he strikes terror to the hearts of frogdom, while the occasional cries of a lost loon, strayed from its flock in northern migration, fill the swamp with sounds of wailing. Flashing through the treetops of the Limberlost, there are birds whose color is more brilliant than that of the gaudiest flower, lifting its face to light and air. The lilies of the mire are not so white as the white herons that fish among them. The ripest spray of goldenrod is not so highly colored as the burnished gold on the breast of the oreo that rocks on it. The jays are bluer than the calamus bed. They wrangle above with throaty chatter. The finches are a finer purple than the ironwort. For every clump of foxfire flaming in the Limberlost, there is a cardinal growing redder on a bush above it. There may not be more numerous than any other birds, but their brilliant coloring and the fearless disposition make them seem so. The cardinal was hatched in the thicket of sweetbriar and blackberry. His father was a tough old widower of many experiences and a variable temper. He was the biggest, most aggressive redbird in the Limberlost, and easily reigned as king of his kind. Catbirds, kingbirds, and shrikes gave him a wide berth, and not even the ever quarrelsome jays plucked up enough courage to antagonize him. A few days after his latest bereavement, he saw a fine, plump young female, and she so filled his eye that he gave her no rest until she permitted his caress and carried the first twig to the wild rose. She was very proud to mate with the king of the Limberlost, and if deep in her heart she felt transient fears of her lordly master, she gave no sign, for she was a bird of goodly proportion and fine feather herself. She chose her location with the eye of an artist and the judgment of a nest builder of more experience. It would be difficult for snakes and squirrels to penetrate that briary thicket. The white berry blossoms scarcely had ceased to attract a swarm of insects before the sweets of the roses recalled them. By the time they had faded, luscious big berries ripened within reach and drew food hunters. She built with far more than ordinary care. It was a beautiful nest, not nearly so carelessly made as those of her kindred all through the swamp. There was a distinct attempt at a cup shape and it really was neatly lined with dried blades of sweet marsh grass. But it was the laying of the, her first egg that the queen cardinal forever distinguished herself. She was a fine healthy bird, full of love and happiness over her first venture in nest building, and she so far surpassed herself on that occasion she had difficulty in convincing anyone that she was responsible for the result. Indeed, she was compelled to lift beak and wing against her mate in defense of this egg, for it was so unusually large that he could not be persuaded short of force that some sneak of the feathered tribe had not slipped in and deposited it in her absence. The king felt sure there was something wrong with the egg and wanted to roll it from the nest, but the queen knew her own and stoutly battled for its protection. She further increased their prospects by laying three others. After that, the king made up his mind that she was a most remarkable bird and went away pleasure-seeking, but the queen settled to brooding, a picture of joyous faith and contentment. Through all the long days, when the heat became tense and the king was none too thoughtful of her appetite or comfort, she nestled those four eggs against her breast and patiently waited. The big egg was her treasure. She gave it constant care. Many times in a day she turned it, and always against her breast there was the individual pressure that distinguished it from the others. It was the first to hatch, of course, and the queen felt that she had enough if all the others failed for her, for this egg piped with a resounding pip, and before the silky down was really dry on the big terracotta body, the young cardinal arose and lustily demanded food.
The king came to him to see him at once and acknowledge subjugation. He was the father of many promising cardinals, yet he had never seen one like this. He set the Limberlost echoes rolling with his jubilant rejoicing. He unceasingly hunted for the ripest berries and seed. He stuffed that baby from morning until night, and never came with food that he did not find him, standing atop of the others calling for more. The queen was just as proud of him, and quite as foolish in her idolatry. But she kept tally, and gave the remainder every other worm in turn. They were unusually fine babies, but what chance has merely a fine baby in a family that possesses a prodigy? The cardinal was as large as any two of the other nestlings, and so red the very down on him seemed tingled with crimson. His skin and even his feet were red. He was the first to climb to the top of the edge of the nest, and the first to hop on a limb. He surprised his parents by finding a slug, and winged his first flight to such a distance that his adoring mother almost went into spasms lest his strength might fail, and he would fall into the swamp and become the victim of a hungry old turtle. He returned safely, however, and the king was so pleased he hunted him an unusually ripe berry, and perching before him, gave him his first language lesson. Of course the cardinal knew how to cry pee and chee when he burst his shell, but the king taught him to chip with accuracy and expression, and he learned that very day that male birds of the cardinal family always call chip, and the females chook. In fact, he learned so rapidly and was generally so observant that before the king thought it was wise to give the next lesson, he found him on a limb, his beak closed, his throat swelling, practicing his own rendering of the tribal calls, Wheat, wheat, wheat! Here, 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 and cheer, cheer, cheer. This so delighted the king that he whistled them over and over and helped the youngster all he could. He was so proud of him that this same night he gave him his first lesson in tucking his head properly and going to sleep alone. In a few more days, when he was sure of his wing strength, he gave him instructions in flying. He taught him how to spread his wings and slowly sail from tree to tree, how to fly in short broken curves to avoid the aim of a hunter, how to turn abruptly in air and make a cork dash after a bug or an enemy. He taught him the proper angle at which to breast a stiff wind and that he always should meet a storm head first so that the water would run as the plumage lay. His first bathing lesson was a pronounced success. The cardinal enjoyed water like a duck. He bathed, splashed, and romped until his mother was almost crazy for fear he would attract a water snake or turtle. But the element of fear was not a part of his disposition. He learned to dry, dress, and plume his feathers, and showed such remarkable pride in keeping himself immaculate that although only a youngster, he was already a bird of such great promise that many of the feathered inhabitants of the Limberlost came to pay him a call. Next the king took him on a long trip around the swamp and taught him to select the proper places to hunt for worms, how to search under leaves for plant life and slugs for meat, which berries were good and safe and the kind of weeds that bore the most and best seeds. He showed him how to find tiny pebbles to grind his food, and how to sharpen and polish his beak. Then he took up the real music lessons and taught him how to whistle, and how to warble and trill. Good cheer, good cheer, intoned the king. Coo cheer, coo cheer, imitated the cardinal. These songs were only studied repetitions, but there was a depth and a volume in his voice that gave promise of future greatness when age should have developed him, and experience awakened his motions. He was an excellent musician for a youngster. He soon did so well in caring for himself, and finding food in flight, and grew so big and independent, 
that he made numerous excursions alone throughout the Limberlost, and so impressive were his proportions, and so aggressive his manner, that he suffered no molestation. In fact, the reign of the king promised to end speedily, but if he feared it, he made no sign, and his pride in his wonderful offspring was always manifest. After the cardinal had explored the swamp thoroughly, a longing for a wider range grew upon him, and day after day he lingered around the borders, looking across the wide cultivated fields, almost aching to test his wings on one long, high, wild stretch of flight. A day came when the heat of the late summer set the marsh steaming, and the cardinal, flying close to the borders, caught the breeze from the upland, and the vision of broad fields stretching toward the north so enticed him that he spread his wings, and following the lines of the trees and fences as much as possible, he made his first journey from home. That day was so delightful that it decided his fortunes. It would seem that the swamp, so appreciated by his kindred, should have been sufficient for the cardinal, but it was not. With every mile he winged his flight came a greater sense of power and strength, and a keener love for the broad sweep of field and forest. His heart bounded with the zest of rocking on the wind, racing through the sunshine, and sailing over the endless panorama of waving cornfields and woodlands. The heat and closeness of the Limberlost seem a prison well escaped, as on and on he flew in straight, untiring flight. Crossing a field of half-ripened corn that sloped to the river, the cardinal saw many birds feeding there, so he alighted on a tall tree to watch them. Soon he decided that he would like to try this new food. He found a place where a crow had left an ear nicely laid open, and clinging to the husk, as he saw the others do, he stretched to his full height and drove his strong, sharp beak into the creamy grain. After the stifling swamp hunting, after the long, exciting flight to rock on this swaying corn and drink on the rich milk of its grain, was to the cardinal his first taste of nectar and ambrosia. He lifted his head when he came to the golden kernel, and chipping at it in tiny specks, he tasted it and approved with all the delight of an epicure in a delicious new dish. Perhaps there were other treats in the next field. He decided to fly even further, but he had gone only a short distance when he changed his course and turned to the south, for below him was a long, shining, creepy thing, fringed with willows, while towering above them were giant sycamore, maple, tulip, and elm trees that caught and rocked with the wind, and the cardinal did not know what it was. Filled with wonder, he dropped lower and lower. Birds were everywhere, many flying over and dipping into it, but its clear, creeping silver was a mystery to the cardinal. The beautiful river of poetry and song that the Indians first discovered and later with the French, named Quebec, the winding, shining river that Logan and Michin Go Misia loved, the only river that could tempt Wakakona from the Salamini and the Mississippi River, beneath whose silver sycamores and giant maples of the chief Godfrey pitched his campfires, was never more beautiful than on that perfect autumn day. With his feathers pressed closely, the cardinal alighted on a willow and leaned to look, quivering with excitement and uttering explosive chips, for there he was, face to face, with a big red bird that appeared neither peaceful nor timid. He uttered an impudent chip of the challenge, which, as it left his beak, was flung back to him. The cardinal flared its crest and half lifted his wings, stiffening them at the butt. The bird he was facing did the same. In his surprise, he arose to his full height with a dexterous little sidestep, and the other bird straightened and sidestepped exactly with him. This was too insulting for the cardinal. Straining every muscle, he made a dash 
at the impudent stranger. He struck the water with such force that it splashed above the willows, as a king fisher, stationed on a stump opposite him, watching the shoals for minnows, saw it. He spread his beak and rolled forth rattling laughter until his voice re-echoed from point to point down the river. The cardinal scarcely knew how he got out, but he had learned a new lesson. That beautiful, shining, creepy thing was water, not thick, tepid, black, marsh water, but pure, cool, silver water. He shook his plumage, feeling a degree redder than shame, but he would not be laughed into leaving. He found it too delightful. In a short time, he ventured down and took a sip, and it was the first real drink of his life. Oh, but it was good. When thirst from the heat and his long flight was quenched, he ventured in for a bath, and that was a new and delightful experience. How he splashed and splashed and sent the silver drops flying. How he ducked and soaked and cooled in that rippling water in which he might remain as long as he pleased and splash his fill. For he could see the bottom for a long distance all around and easily could avoid anything attempting to harm him. He was so wet when his bath was finished he scarcely could reach a bush to dry and dress his plumage. Once again, in perfect feather, he remembered the bird of the water and returned to the willow. There, in the depths of the shining river, the cardinal discovered himself, and his heart swelled big with just pride. Was that broad, full breast his? Where had he seen any other cardinal with a crest so high it waved in the wind? How big and black his eyes were, and his beard were almost as long and crisp as his father's. Where had he seen any other cardinal with a crest so high it waved in the wind? How big and black his eyes were, and his beard were almost as long and crisp as his father's. He spread his wings and gloated on their sweep, and twisted and flirted his tail. He went over his toilet again, and dressed every feather on him. He scoured the back of his neck with the butt of his wings, and tucking his head under them, slowly drew it out time after time to polish his crest. He turned and twisted, he rocked and paraded, and every glimpse he caught of his size and beauty filled him with pride. He strutted like a peacock and chattered like a jay. When he could find no further points to admire, something else caught his attention. When he chirped, there was an answering chip across the river. Certainly there was no cardinal there so it must be that he was hearing his own voice as well as seeing himself. Selecting a conspicuous perch, he sent an inclusive chip across the water, and in kind it came back to him. Then he chipped, softly and tenderly, as he did in the Limberlost to a favorite little sister, who often came and perched beside him in the maple where he slept, and softly and tenderly came the answer. Then the cardinal understood. Wheat! Wheat, wheat. He whistled it high, and he whistled it low. Cheer, cheer, cheer. He whistled it tenderly and sharply and imperiously. Hear, hear, hear. At this ringing command, every bird, as far as the river carried his voice, came to investigate and remained to admire. Over and over he rang every change he could invent. He made a gallant effort at warbling and trilling, and then, with the gladdest heart he ever had known, he made a gallant effort at warbling and trilling, and then, with the gladdest heart he had ever known, he burst into a rilling song. Good cheer, good cheer, good cheer. As evening came on, he grew restless and uneasy, so he slowly winged his way back to the Limberlost. But that day forever spoiled him for a swamp bird. In the night he restlessly ruffled his feathers and sniffed for the breeze of the meadows. He tasted the corn and the clear water again. He admired his image in the river and longed for the sound of his voice until he began murmuring, wheat, 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 in his sleep. In the earliest dawn a robin awoke him in singing, cheer up, cheer up, and he answered with a sleepy, cheer, cheer, cheer. 
Later, the robin sang again with exquisite softness and tenderness. Cheer up, dearie. Cheer up, dearie. Cheer up, cheer up, cheer. The cardinal, now fully awakened, shouted lustily, Good cheer, good cheer. And after that it was only a short time until he was on his way toward the shining river. It was better than before, and every following day found him feasting in the cornfield and bathing in the shining water, but he always returned to his family at nightfall. When black frost began to strip the limberlost, and food was almost reduced to a dry seed, there came a day on which the king marshaled his followers and gave the magic signal. With dusk he led them southward, mile after mile, until their breath fell short and their wings ached with unaccustomed flight. But because of the trips to the river, the cardinal was stronger than the others, and he easily kept abreast of the king. In the early morning, even before the robins were awake, the king settled in the Everglades. But the cardinal had lost all liking for swamp life, so he stubbornly set out alone, and in a short time he had found another river. It was not quite so delightful as the shining river, but still it was beautiful, and on its gently sloping bank was an orange orchard. There the cardinal rested and found a winter home after his heart's desire. The following morning a golden-haired little girl and an old man with snowy locks came hand in hand through the orchard. The child saw the red bird and immediately claimed him, and that same day the edict went forth that a very dreadful time was in store for anyone who harmed or even frightened the cardinal. So in security became a series of days that were pure delight. The orchard was alive with insects attracted by the heavy odors, and slugs infested the bark. Feasting was almost as good as in the Limberlost, and always there was the river to drink from and to splash in it at will. In those days the child and the old man lingered for hours in the orchard, watching the bird that every day seemed to grow bigger and brighter. What a picture his coat, now a bright cardinal red, made against the waxy green leaves. How big and brilliant he seemed as he raced and darted and played among the creamy blossoms. How the little girl stood with clasped hands, worshipping him, as with the swelling throat he rocked on the highest spray and sang his inspiring chorus over and over, Good cheer, good cheer. Every day they came to watch and listen. They scattered crumbs, and the cardinal grew so friendly that he greeted their coming with a quick chip-chip, while the delighted child tried to repeat it after him. Soon they became such friends that when he saw them approaching, he would softly call, Chip-chip, and then with beady eyes and tilted his head, awaited her reply. Sometimes a member of his family from the Everglades found his way into the orchard, and the cardinal, having grown to feel a sense of proprietorship, resented the intrusion and pursued him like a streak of flame. Whenever any straggler had this experience, he returned to the swamp, realizing the cardinal of the orange orchard was almost twice his size and strength, and so startling red as to be a wonder. One day a gentle breeze from the north sprang up and stirred the orange branches, wafting the heavy perfume across the land and out to sea, and spread in its stead a cool, delicate, pungent odor. The cardinal lifted his head and whistled an inquiring note. He was not certain and went on searching for slugs, and predicting happiness in full round notes, good cheer, good cheer. Again the odor swept the orchard, so strong that this time there was no mistaking it. The cardinal darted to the topmost branch, his crest flaring, his tail twitching nervously. Chip, chip, he cried with excited insistence. Chip, chip. The breeze was coming stiffly and steadily now, unlike anything the cardinal had ever known, for its cool breath told of the ice-bound fields breaking up under the sun. Its damp touch was from the spring showers washing the face of the Northland. 
its subtle odor was the commingling of myriads of unfolding leaves and crisp plants upspringing its pungent perfume was the pollen of catkins up in the land of the limberlost old mother nature with stringent muttering had set about her annual house cleaning with her efficient broom the march wind she was sweeping every nook and cranny clean with her scrub bucket overflowing with april showers she was washing the face of all creation as if these measures failed to produce cleanliness to her satisfaction she gave a final polish with storms of hail the shining river was filled to overflowing breaking up the ice and carrying a load of refuge it went rolling to the sea the ice and snow had not altogether gone but the long pregnant earth was mothering her children she cringed at every step for the ground was teeming with life bug and worm were now working to light and warmth thrusting aside the mold and leaves above them spring beauties hepaticas and violets lifted their tender golden green heads the sap was flowing and leafless trees were covered with swelling buds delicate mosses were creeping over every stick of decaying timber the lichens on stone and fence were freshly painted in unending shades of gray and green myriads of flowers and vines were springing up to cover last year's decaying leaves the beautiful uncut hair of graves was creeping over meadow spreading beside roadways and blanketing every naked spot the limberlost was waking to life even ahead of the fields in the river through the winter it had been the barest and dreariest of places but now the earliest signs of returning spring were in its martial music for when the green hyla pipes and the bullfrog drums the bird voices soon joined them the catkins bloomed first and then in an incredible short time flags rushes and vines were like a sea of waving green and swelling buds were ready to burst in the upland the smoke was curling over sugar camp and clearing in the forest animals were rousing from their long sleep the shad were starting anew their never-ending journey up the shining river peeps of green were mantling hilltop and valley and the northland was ready for its dreariest springtime treasures to come home again from overhead were ringing those first glad notes caught nearer the throne than those of any other birds spring o year spring o year while still legged little killdeers were scuttling around the limberlost and beside the river flinging from the cloudland their killdeer killdeer call the robins in their orchards were pulling the long dried blades of last year's grass from beneath the snow to line their mud wall cups and the bluebirds were at the hollow apple tree flat on the top rail the doves were gathering their first coarse sticks and twigs together it was such a splendid place to set their cradle the weather-beaten rotten old rails were the very color of the busy dove mother her red rim eye fitted into the background like a tiny scarlet lichen cup surely no one would ever see her the limber lost and shining river the fields and forests the wayside bushes and fences the stumps the logs hollow trees even the bare brown breast of mother earth were all waiting to cradle their own again and by one of the untold miracles each would return to its place there was an intoxication in the air the subtle pungent ravishing odors on the wind of unfolding trees ice water washed plants and catkin pollen were an elixir to humanity the cattle of the field were fairly drunk with it and herds dry fed through the winter were coming to their first grazing with heads thrown high romping bellowing and racing like wild things the north wind sweeping from icy fastnesses caught the order of spring and carried it to the orange orchard and the everglades and at a breath of it 
crazed with excitement, the cardinal went flaming through the orchard, for with no one to teach him, he knew what it meant. The call had come. Holidays were over. It was time to go home. Time to riot in crisp freshness. Time to go courting. Time to make love. Time to possess his own. Time for mating and nest building. All that day he flashed around, nervous with dread of the unknown, and palpitant with delightful expectation. But with the coming of dusk, he began his journey northward. When he passed the Everglades, he winged his way slowly, and repeatedly sent down a challenging chip, but there was no answer. Then the cardinal knew that the north wind had carried a true message, for the king and his followers were ahead of him on their way to the Limberlost. Mile after mile, a thing of pulsing fire, he breasted the blue-black night, and it was not so long until he could discern a flickering patch of darkness sweeping the sky before him. The cardinal flew steadily in a straight sweep, until with a throb of triumph in his heart he arose in his course, and from far overhead flung down a boastful challenge to the king and his followers, as he assailed above them and was lost from sight. It was still dusky with the darkness of night when he crossed the Limberlost, dropping low enough to see its branches laid bare, to catch a gleam of green in its swelling buds, and to hear the wavering chorus of its frogs. But there was no hesitation in his flight. Straight and sure, he winged his way toward the shining river, and it was only a few more miles until the rolling waters of its springtime flood caught his eye. Dropping precipitately, he plunged his burning beak into the loved water. Then he flew into a fine old stag sumac and tucked his head under his wing for a short rest. He had made the long flight in one unbroken sweep, and he was sleepy. In utter content, he ruffled his feathers and closed his eyes, for he was beside the shining river and it would be another season before the orange orchard would ring again with his good cheer, good cheer. End of chapter one. Recording by Mr. Krause. Chapter two of the Song of the Cardinal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What year, what year, prophesied the cardinal. The sumac seemed to fill his idea of a perfect location from the very first. He perched on a limb, and between dressing his plumage and pecking at last year's sour dried berries, he sent abroad his prediction. Old Mother Nature verified his wisdom by sending a dashing shower, but he cared not at all for a wedding. He knew how to turn his crimson suit into the most perfect of waterproof coats, so he flattened his chest, sleeked his feathers, and breasting the April downpour, kept on calling for rain. He knew he would appear brighter when it was past, and he seemed to know too that every day of sunshine and shower would bring nearer his heart's desire. He was a very Beau Brummel while he waited. From morning until night he bathed, dressed his feathers, sunned himself, fluffed and flirted. He strutted and chipped incessantly. He claimed that sumac for his very own and stoutly battled for possession with many intruders. It grew on a densely wooded slope and the shining river went singing between the grassy banks whitened with spring beauties below it. Crowded around it were thickets of pawpaw, wild grape vines, thorn, dogwood, and red haw that attracted bug and insect, and just across the old snake fence was a field of mellow mold sloping to the river that soon would be plowed for corn, turning out numberless big fat grubs. He was compelled almost hourly to wage battles for his location, for there was something fine about the old stag sumac that attracted homestead seekers. A sober pair of robins began laying their foundations there the morning the cardinal arrived, 
and a couple of blackbirds tried to take possession before the day had passed. He had little trouble with the robins. They were easily conquered, but with small protest settled a rod up the bank in a wild plum tree. But the air was thick with chips, chatter, and red and black feathers before the blackbirds acknowledged defeat. They were old timers and knew about the grubs and the young corn, but they also knew when they were beaten. So they moved downstream to a scrub oak, trying to assure each other that it was the place they had really wanted from the first. The cardinal was left boasting and strutting in the sumac, but in his heart he found it lonesome business. Being the son of a king, he was much too dignified to beg for a mate, and besides, it took all his time to guard the sumac. But his eyes were wide open to all that went on around him, and he envied the blackbird his glossy, devoted little sweetheart with all his might. He almost strained his voice trying to rival the love song of a skylark that hung among the clouds above the meadow across the river and poured down to his mate a story of adoring love and sympathy. He screamed a chip of such savage jealousy at a pair of killdeer lovers that he sent them scampering down the river bank without knowing that the crime of which they stood convicted was that of being mated when he was not. As for the doves that were already brooding on the line fence beneath the maples, the cardinal was torn between the two opinions. He was alone, he was lovesick, and he was holding the finest building location beside the shining river for his mate, and her slowness in coming made their devotion difficult to endure when he coveted a true love. But it seemed to the cardinal that he never could so forget himself as to emulate the example of that dove lover. The dove had no dignity. He was so effusive, he was a nuisance. He kept his dignified Quaker mate stuffed to discomfort. He clung to the side of the nest, trying to help brood until he almost crowded her from the eggs. He pestered her with caresses and cooed over his love song until every chipmunk on the line fence was familiar with his story. The cardinal's temper was worn to such a fine edge that he darted at the dove one day and pulled a big tuft of feathers from his back. When he had returned to the sumac, he was compelled to admit that his anger lay quite as much in that he had no one to love as because the dove was distinguishedly devoted. Every morning brought new arrivals, trim young females fresh from their long holiday, and big boastful males appearing their brightest and bravest, each singer almost splitting his throat in the effort to captivate the mate he coveted. They came back flashing down the river bank like rockets of scarlet, gold, blue, and black, rocking on the willows, splashing in the water, bursting into jets of melody, making every possible display of their beauty and music, and at times fighting fiercely when they discovered that the females they were wooing favored their rivals and desired only to be friendly with them. The heart of the cardinal sank as he watched. There was not a member of his immediate family among them. He pitied himself as he wondered if fate had in store for him the trials he saw others suffering. Those dreadful feathered females. How they coquetted. How they flirted. How they sleeked and flattened their plumage. And with half-open beaks and sparkling eyes hopped closer and closer as if charmed. The eager singers with swelling throats sang and sang in the very frenzy of extravagant pleading. But just when they felt their little loves were on the point of surrender, a rod distant above the bushes would go streaks of feathers, and there was nothing left but to endure the better disappointment, follow them, and begin all over. For the last three days the cardinal had been watching his cousin, rose-breasted, Grosbeak make violent love to the most exquisite little female, who apparently encouraged his advances, only to see him left sitting as blue 
and disconsolate as any human lover when he discovers that the maid who had coquitted him for a season belongs to another man the cardinal flew to the very top of the highest sycamore and looked cross country toward the limberlost should he go there seeking a swamp mate among its kindred it was not an endurable thought to be sure matters were becoming serious no bird beside the shining river had plumed paraded or made more music than he was it all to be wasted by this time he confidently had expected results only that morning he had swelled with pride as he heard mrs j tell her quarrelsome husband that she wished she could exchange him for the cardinal did not the gentle dove pause by the sumac when she left brooding to take her morning dip in the dust and gaze at him with unconcealed admiration no doubt she devoutly wished her plain pudgy husband wore a scarlet coat but it is praise from one's own sex that is praised indeed and only an hour ago the lark had reported that from his lookout above the cloud he saw no other singer anywhere so splendid as the cardinal of the sumac because of these things he held fast to his conviction that he was a prince indeed and he decided to remain in his chosen location and with his physical and vocal attractions compel the finest little cardinal in the fields to seek him he planned it all very carefully how she would hear his splendid music and come to take a peep at him how she would be captivated by his size and beauty how she would come timidly but come of course for his approval how he would condescend to accept her if she pleased him in all particulars how she would be devoted to him how she would approve his choice of a home for the sumac was in a lovely spot for scenery as well as nest building for several days he had boasted he had bantered he had challenged he had on this last day almost condescending to coaxing but not one little bright-eyed cardinal female had come to offer herself the performance of a brown thrush drove him wild with envy the thrush came gliding up the river bank a rusty coated sneaking thing of the underbrush and taking possession of a thorn bush just opposite of the sumac he sang for an hour in the open there was no way to improve that music it was woven fresh from the warp and woof of his fancy it was a song so filled with the joy and gladness of spring notes so filled with love's pleading and passion's tender pulsing pain that at its close there were half dozen admiring thrush females gathered around with care and deliberation the brown thrush selected the most attractive and she followed him to the thicket as if charmed it was the cardinal's dream materialized for another before his very eyes and it filled him with envy if that plain brown bird that slinked as if he had a theft to account for could by showing himself and singing for an hour win a mate why should not he the most gorgeous bird of the woods openly flaunting his charms and discoursing his music have at least equal success should he the proudest most magnificent of cardinals be compelled to go seeking a mate like any common bird perish the thought he went to the river to bathe after finding a spot where the water flowed crystal clear over a bed of white limestone he washed until he felt he could be no cleaner then the cardinal went to his favorite sun parlor and stretching on a limb he stood his feathers on end and sunned fluffed and prinked until he was immaculate on the tip-top antler of the old stag sumac he perched and strained until his jetty whiskers appeared stubby he poured out a tumultuous cry vibrant with every passion raging in him he caught up his own rolling echoes and changed and varied them he improvised and set the shining river ringing wet year wet year he whistled and whistled until all birdland and even mankind heard 
for the farmer paused at his kitchen door with his pails of foaming milk and called to his wife. Hear that, Maria? Just hear it. I swainy, if that bird doesn't stop predicting wet weather, I'll get so scared I won't durst put in my corn afore June. They some birds like killdeers and bob whites that can make things pretty plain, but I can never hear a bird that could just speak words out clear and distinct like that fellow. Seems to come from the river bottom. Believe I'll just step down that way and see if the lower field is ready for the plow yet. Abram Johnson, said his wife, beans you set up for an honest man, if you want to traipse through slush and drizzle a half a mile to see a bird, why say so? But don't for land sakes lay it on to plowin' at you know in all conscience won't be ready for a week yet, thought pretendin' to look at. Abram grinned sheepishly. I'm willing to call it the bird if you are, Maria. I've been hearin' him from the barn all day, and there's something kind of human in his notes that takes me just a little different from any other bird i ever noticed i'm really curious to set eyes on him seems to me from his singing out to the barn it ud be mighty near like meetin folks bosh exclaimed maria i don't suppose he sings a mite better than any other bird it's just the old wabash rollin up the echoes a bird singing beside the river always sounds twice as fine as the one on the hills. I've knowed that for forty year. Chances are at he'll be gone before you get there. As Abram opened the door, wet year, wet year, pealed the flaming prophet. He went out, closing the door softly, and with an utter disregard for the cornfield, made a bee line for the musician. I don't know as this is the best for twinges or rheumatiz, he muttered as he turned up his collar and drew his old hat lower to keep the splashing drops from his face. I don't just rightly suppose I should go, but I'm free to admit I'd as leaf be dead as not to answer when I get a call, and the fact is I'm called down beside the river. What year, what year, rolled the cardinal's prediction. Thank ye, old fellow. Glad to hear ye. Didn't just need the information, but I got my bearings rightly from it. I can about pick out your bush, and it's as well along toward evening, too, and must be mighty near your bedtime. Looks as if you might be staying round these parts. I'd like it powerful well if you'd settle right here, say about where you are, and... Where are you anyway? Abram went peering and dodging beside the fence, peeping into the bushes, searching for the bird. Suddenly there was a whir of wings and a streak of crimson. Scared you into the next county, I suppose, he muttered. But it came nearer being a scared man than a frightened bird, for the cardinal flashed straight toward him until only a few yards away and then swayed on a bush. It chipped, cheered, peaked, whistled broken notes, and manifested perfect delight at the sight of the white-haired old man. Abram stared in astonishment. Lord Almighty, he gasped, big as a blackbird, red as a live coal, and a coming right at me. You are somebody's pet, that's what you are. And no, you ain't either. Settin on a sod stick in a little wire house takes all the ginger out of any bird, and their feathers are always mussy. Inside o a cage, never saw you, for they ain't a feather out of old place on you. You are a finer piece of old red satin. And you got that way of sitting and dancing and high stepping right out in God's almighty big woods, a teetering in the wind, and a darting across the water. Cage never touched you, but you are somebody's pet just the same. 
and I look like the man, and you are trying to tell me so, by gum. Leaning toward Abram, the cardinal turned his head from side to side and peered, chipped, and waited for an answering chip from a little golden-haired child, but there was no way for the man to know that. It's just as sure as fate, he said. You think you know me, and you're trying to tell me something. Wish to land I know what you want. Are you trying to tell me howdy? Well, I don't know. Lo, nobody'd be politer, and I am, and so far I know. Abram lifted his old hat, and the raindrops glistened on his white hair. He squared his shoulders and stood very erect. Howdy, Mr. Redbird. How did you find yourself this evening? I don't just recollect in ever seeing you before, but I'll never meet you again, though knowing you. When did you arrive? Come through the special midnight flyer, did you? Well, you never was more welcome any place in your life. I'd give you a right smart sum this minute if you'd say you came to settle on this river bank. How do you like it? To my mind, it's just as near paradise as you'll strike on earth. Old Wabash is a twister for curving and winding round, and it's limestone bed half the way, and the water's as pretty and clear as Maria's spring house. And as for trimming, why say, Mr. Redbird, I'll just leave it to you. If she ain't all trimmed up like a woman's spring bonnet, look at the grass a creepin' right down till it's a trailin' in the water. Did you ever see just quite such fine fringy willers? And you wait a little, and the flower and mallows that grows long the shiny old river are as fine as garden hollyhocks. Maria says, at thy'd be prettier than hers if they were only double. But Lord, Mr. Redbird, they are. See em once on the bank and again in the water, and back a little, and there's just thickets of pawpaw, and thorns, and wild grapevines, and crab, and redden, and blackhaw, and dogwood, and sumac, and spice bush, and trees, Lord, Mr. Redbird, the sycamores, and maples, and tulip, and ash, and elm trees are so bursting, fine along the old Wabash. They put em into poetry books, and sing songs about em. What do you think of that? Just back of you a little there's a sycamore, split into five trunks, any one of them a famous big tree. Tops up among the clouds, and roots digging under the old river, and over a little farther's a maple. That's eight big trees in one. Most anything you can name, you can find it long this old Wabash, if you only know where to hunt for it. These mighty few white men take the trouble to look, but the Indians used to know. They'd come up canoeing and fishing down the river and camp under these very trees. And Ma would get so mad at the old squaws. Settlers weren't so thick then, and you had to be mighty careful not to rile em as they'd come a traipsin with their wild berries. Wood full of berries. Anybody could get em by the bushel for the pickin', and we hadn't got to the raisin much wheat, and had to carry it onto the horses over into Ohio to get it milled. Took Pop five days to make the trip, and then the blame old squaws had come, and Ma'd be compelled to hand over to Em her big white loaves. Just about set her plum crazy. Used to get up in the night and fix her yeast and bake and let the oven cool and hide the bread out in the wheat bin and get the smell of it all out of the house by good daylight, so that she could say there wasn't a loaf in the cabin. Oh, if it's good pickin' you're after, they's berries for all creation, long the river yet. And just wait a few days till old April 
gets done showering and I plant this cornfield. Abram set a foot on the third rail and leaned his elbows on the top. The cardinal chipped delightedly and hopped and tilted closer. I hadn't just lowed all winter I'd tackle this field again. I turned it every spring for forty year. Bought it when I was a young fellow, just married to Maria. Shouldered a big debt on it. But I always loved these sloping fields, and my share of this old Wabash hasn't been for sale nor trade in any time this past forty year. I'd hung on to it like grim death, for it's just that much o' paradise I'm plumb sure of. First time I plowed this field, Mr. Redbird, I only hid the high places. Just married Maria, and I didn't touch earth any too frequent all that summer. I'd plowed it every year since, and I've been lowing it all this winter, when the rheumatiz was getting in its work. And I'd give it up this spring and turn it to matter, but I don't know. Once I got started, believe I could do it all right and not feel it so much, if you'd stay to cheer me up a little and post me on the weather. Hate the dog on us to own I'm worsting. If you say it stay, believe me, I'll try it. Very sight of you kinder warms the cockles of my heart all up, and every skip you take sets me a wantin' to be jumpin' too. What on earth you lookin' for, man? I believe it's grub. Somebody's been feedin' you, and you want me to keep it up? Well, you struck it all right, Mr. Redbird. Feed you? You bet I will. You needn't even wrestle for grubs if you don't want to. Like as not you're feeling hungry right now. Pickin' being so slim these early days. Land sakes, I hope you don't feel like you've come too soon. I'll fetch you everything on the place. It's likely a redbird ever touched early in the morning. If you'll say you'll stay and wave your torch. Long my river bank this summer. I haven't a scrap about me now. Yes, I have too. Here's a handful of corn I was taking to the banty rooster. But shucks, he's fat as a young shoat now. Corn's a little big and hard for you. Maybe I could split it up a mite. Abram took out his jackknife and dotting a row of grains along the top rail, he split and shaved them down as fine as possible. And as he reached one end of the rail, the cardinal, with a spasmodic chip, dashed down and snatched a particle from the other, and flashed back to the bush, tested and approved, and chipped his thanks. Pshaw now, said Abram, staring wide-eyed. Doesn't that beat you? So you really are a pet? Best kind of pet in the whole world, too. Making everybody at sees you happy and having some chance to be happy yourself. And I look like your friend? Well, well, I'm monstrous willing to adopt you if you'll take me. And as for feeding, from tomorrow on I'll find time to set your little table along the same rail every day. I suppose Maria'll say I'm gone plumb crazy. But for that matter, if I ever get her down to see you just once, the trick's done with her too. For you're the prettiest thing God ever made in the shape of a bird that I ever saw. Look at that top notch, a wavin' in the wind. Maybe praise to the face is an open disgrace, but I'll take your share in mine too. And tell you right here and now that you're the blamest prettiest thing I ever saw. But Lord, you oughtn't be so careless. Don't you know you ain't nothing but just a target? Why don't you keep out of sight a little? You come a shinying up to nine out of ten men along the river like this, and your pretty coaxing, palavering way won't save a feather on you. You'll get the little red heart shot plumb out of your little red body. And that's what you'll get. It's a dratted shame. And there's such a law to protect you, too. They's a big fine for killing such as you. But nobody seems to push it. 
every fool wants to test his aim, and you're the brightest thing on the river bank for a mark. Well, if you'll stay right where you are, it'll be a sorry day for any cuss that touches you, I'll promise you, Mr. Redbird. This land's mine, and if you locate on it, you're mine till time to go back to that other old fellow that looks like me. Wonder if he's any willinger to feed you and stand up for you as I am. Hear, 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 whistled the cardinal. Well, I'm mighty glad if you're saying you'll stay. Guess it will be all right if you don't meet some of them Limberloss hens and toll off the swamp, Lord. The Limberloss ain't to be compared with the river, Mr. Redbird. You're foolish if you go. Talk it about going. I must be going myself, or Berea will be coming down the line fence with the lantern, and come to think of it, I'm a little moist, not to say downright damp. But then you warned me, didn't you, old fella? Well, I told Maria, seeing you it would be like meeting folks, and it has been. Good deal more than I was counting on, and I've talked more than I have in a whole year. Hardly think now that I've got the reputation of being a mighty quiet fellow, would you? Abram straightened and touched his hat brim in a trim half military salute. Well, goodbye, Mr. Redbird. Never had more pleasure meeting anyone in my life except first time I met Maria. You think about the plowing, and if you stay, it's a go. Goodbye, and do be a little more careful of yourself. See you in the morning, right after breakfast. No count taken of the weather. What year? What year? called the cardinal after his retreating figure. Abram turned and gravely saluted the second time. The cardinal went to the top rail and feasted on the sweet grains of corn until his craw was full, and then nestled in the sumac and went to sleep. Early next morning he was abroad and in fine toilet, and with a full voice from the top of the sumac greeted the day. Wet year, wet year. Far down the river echoed his voice until it so closely resembled some member of his family replying that he followed, searching the banks mile after mile on either side until finally he heard voices of his kind. He located them, but it was only several staid old couples, a long time mated, and busy with their nest building. The cardinal returned to the sumac, feeling a degree lonelier than before. He decided to prospect in the opposite direction, and taking wing, he started up the river. Following the channel, he winged his flight for miles over the cool, sparkling water between the tangle of foliage bordering the banks. When he came to the long, cumbrous structures of wood with which men had bridged the river, where the shuffling feet of tired farm horses raised clouds of dust and set the echoes rolling with their thunderous hoofbeats, he was afraid, and rising high he sailed over them in short broken curves of flight, but where giant maple and ash leaning locked branches across the channel and one of the old mother nature's bridges for the squirrels he knew no fear and dipped so low beneath them that his image trailed a wavering shadow on the silver path he followed. He rounded curve after curve, and frequently stopping on a conspicuous perch, flung a ringing challenge in the face of the morning. With every mile, the way he followed grew more beautiful. The river bed was limestone, and the swiftly flowing water clear and limpid. Banks were precipitant in some places, gently sloping in others, and always crowded with a tangle of foliage. At an abrupt curve in the river, he mounted to the summit of a big ash and made a boastful prophecy. What year, what year? And on all sides, there sprang up the voices of his kind. Startled, the cardinal took wing. He followed the river in a circling flight until he remembered that here might be the opportunity to win the coveted river mate, and growing slower to select the highest branch on which to display his charms, he discovered that he was only a few yards from the ash from which he made his prediction. The cardinal flew over the narrow neck and sent another call, 
and then without awaiting a reply, again he flashed up the river and circled Horseshoe Bend. When he came to the same ash the third time, he understood. The river circled in one great curve. The cardinal mounted to the tip-top limb of the ash and looked around him. There was never a fairer sight for the eye of man or bird. The mist and shimmer of early spring were in the air. The wabash rounded Horseshoe Bend in a silver circle, rimmed by a tangle of foliage bordering both its banks, and inside lay a long open space covered with waving marsh grass and the blue bloom of sweet calamus. Scattered around were mighty trees, but conspicuous above any. In the very center was a giant sycamore, split at its base into three large trees, whose waving branches seemed to sweep the face of heaven, and whose roots, like miserly fingers, clutched deep into the black muck of rainbow bottom. It was in this lovely spot that the rainbow at last materialized, and at its base, free to all humanity who cared to seek the great alchemist had left his rarest treasures, the gold of sunshine, diamond water drops, emerald foliage, and sapphire sky. For good measure there were added seeds, berries, and insects for all the birds, and wildflowers, fruit, and nuts for his children. Above all, the sycamore waved its majestic head. It made a throne that seemed suitable for the son of the king, and mounting to its topmost branch, for miles the river carried its challenge. Ho, cardinals, look this way. Behold me. Have you seen any other of so great size? Have you any to equal my grace? Who can whistle so loud, so clear, so compelling a note? Who will fly to me for protection? Who will come and be my mate? He flared his crest high, swelled his throat with rolling notes and appeared so big and brilliant that among the many cardinals that had gathered to hear there was not one to compare with him black envy filled their hearts who was this flaming dashing stranger flaunting himself at the faces of their females there were many unmated cardinals in rainbow bottom and many jealous males a second time the cardinal rocking and flashing, proclaimed himself. And there was a note of feminine approval so strong that he caught it. Tilting on a twig, his crest flared to full height. His throat swelled to bursting, his heart too big for his body. The cardinal shouted his challenge for the third time. When clear and sharp arose a cry in the answer, Here! Here, here. It came from a female that had accepted the caresses of the brightest cardinal in Rainbow Bottom only the day before, and had spent the morning carrying twigs to a thicket of red haws. The cardinal, with a royal flourish, sprang in air to seek her, but her outraged mate was ahead of him, and with a scream she fled, leaving a tuft of feathers in her mate's beak. In turn, the cardinal struck him like a flashing rocket, and then red war raged in Rainbow Bottom. The females scattered for cover with all their might. The cardinal worked in a kiss on one poor little bird, too frightened to escape him. Then the males closed in, and serious business began. The cardinal would have enjoyed a fight vastly with two or three opponents, but a half dozen made discretion better than valor. He darted among them, scattering them right and left, and made for the sycamore. With all his remaining breath, he insolently repeated his challenge, and then headed downstream for the sumac with what grace he could command. There was an hour of angry recrimination before sweet peace birded again in Rainbow Bottom. The newly mated pair finally made up. The females speedily resumed their coquetting and forgot the captivating stranger, all save the poor little one that had been kissed by accident. 
She never had been kissed before, and never had expected that she would be, for she was a creature of many misfortunes of every nature. She had been hatched from a fifth egg to begin with, and every one knows the disadvantage of beginning life with four sturdy, older birds on top of one. It was a meager egg, and a feeble baby that pipped its shell. The remainder of the family stood and took nearly all the food, so that she almost starved in the nest, and she never really knew the luxury of a hearty meal until her elders had flown. That lasted only a few days, for the others went then, and their parents followed them so far afield that the poor little soul, clamoring alone in the nest, almost perished. Hunger driven, she climbed to the edge and exercised her wings until she managed some sort of flight to a neighboring bush. She missed the twig and fell to the ground, where she lay cold and shivering. She cried pitifully and was almost dead when a brown-faced, barefoot boy with a fishing pole on his shoulder passed and heard her. Poor little thing, you are almost dead, he said. I know what I'll do with you. I'll take you over and set you in the bushes where I heard those other red birds, and then your ma will feed you. The boy turned back and carefully set her on a limb close to one of her brothers, and there she got just enough food to keep her alive. So her troubles continued. Once a squirrel chased her, and she saved herself by crowding into a hole so small her pursuer could not follow. The only reason she escaped a big blue racer when she went to take her first bath was that a hawk had his eye on the snake and had snapped it up just at the proper moment to save the poor quivering little bird. She was left so badly frightened that she could not move for a long time. All the tribulations of Birdland fell to her lot. She was so frail and weak. She lost her family in migration and followed with some strangers that were none too kind. Life in the South had been full of trouble. Once a bullet grazed her so closely, she lost two of her wing quills, and that made her more timid than ever. Coming north, she had given out again, and finally had wandered into Rainbow Bottom, lost and alone. She was such a shy, fearsome little body, the females all flouted her, and the males never seemed to notice that there was material in her for a very fine mate. Every other female cardinal in the Rainbow Bottom had several males courting her, but this poor frightened, lonely one had never a suitor, and she needed love so badly. Now she had been kissed by this magnificent stranger. Of course she knew it was really not her kiss. He had intended it for the bold creature that had answered his challenge, but since it came to her, it was hers, in a way after all. She hid in the underbrush for the remainder of the day and was never so frightened in all her life. She brooded over it constantly and morning found her at the down curve of the horseshoe, straining her ears for the rarest note she had ever heard. All day she hid and waited, and the following days were filled with longing, but he never came again. So one morning, possessed with courage she did not understand, and filled with the longing that drove her against her will, she started down the river. For miles she sneaked through the underbrush and watched and listened. Until at last night came and she returned to Rainbow Bottom. The next morning she set out early and flew to the spot from which she turned back the night before. From there she glided through the bushes and underbrush, trembling and quaking, yet pushing stoutly onward straining her ears for some note of the brilliant strangers. It was mid-forenoon when she reached the region of the sumac, and as she hopped warily along, only a short distance from her, full and splendid, there burst the voice of the singer from whom she was searching. She sprang into air and fled a mile before she realized that she was flying. Then she stopped and listened, and rolling with the river, she heard those bold, true tones. Close to earth, she went back again, to see if, unobserved, 
she could find a spot where she might watch the stranger that had kissed her. When at last she reached a place where she could see him plainly, his beauty was so bewildering and his song was so enticing that she gradually hopped closer and closer without knowing she was moving. High in the sumac, the cardinal had sung until his throat was parched and the fountain of hope was almost dry. There was nothing save defeat from overwhelming numbers in Rainbow Bottom. He had paraded and made all the music he had ever been taught and improvised much more, yet no one had come to seek him. Was it of necessity to be of the limber lost then? This one day more he would retain his dignity and his location. He tipped, tilted, and flirted. He whistled and sang and trilled over the lowland and up and down the shining river, ringing in every change he could event. He sent for the last time his prophetic message. Wet year, wet year. End of chapter two. Chapter Three of The Song of the Cardinal by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three. Come here, come here, entreated the cardinal. He felt that his music was not reaching his standard as he burst into this new song. He was almost discouraged. No way seemed open to him but flight to the Limberloss, and he so disdained the swamp that love-making would lose something of its greatest charm if he were driven there for a mate. The time seemed ripe for stringent measures, and the cardinal was ready to take them, but how could he stringently urge a little mate that would not come on his imploring invitations? He listlessly pecked at the berries and flung abroad an acquiring chip with just an atom of hope. He frequently mounted to his choir loft and issued an order that savored far more of a plea. Come here, come here! And then, leaning, he listened intently to the voice of the river, lest he fail to catch the faintest responsive chook it might bear. He could hear the sniffling of carp wallowing beside the bank. A big pickerel slashed around, breakfasting on minnows. Opposite the sumac, the black bass with gammy spring snapped up before it struck the water. Every luckless, honey-laden insect that fell from the feast of sweets in a blossom-whitened wild crab. The sharp bark of the red squirrel and the low of the cattle, lazily chewing their cuds among the willows, came to him. The hammering of a woodpecker on a dead sycamore a little above him, rolled to his straining ears like a drum beat. The cardinal hated the woodpecker more than he disliked the dove. It was only foolishly effusive, but the woodpecker was a veritable bluebeard. The cardinal longed to pull the feathers from his back until it was as red as his head, for the woodpecker had dressed his suit in finest style, and with the dulcet tones and melting tenderness had gone according, sweet as the doves had been his wooing, and one more pang the lonely cardinal had suffered at being forced to witness his felicity. Yet scarcely had his plump, amiable little mate consented to his caresses and approved the sycamore before he turned on her, pecking her severely, and pulled out a tuft of plumage from her breast. There was not the least excuse for this tyrannical action, and the sight filled the cardinal with rage. He fully expected to see Madame Woodpecker divorce herself and flee her new home, and he most earnestly hoped that she would. But she did no such thing. She meekly flattened her feathers, hurried work in a lively manner, and tried in every way to anticipate and avert her mate's displeasure. Under this treatment, he grew more abusive and now madame woodpecker dodged every time she came within his reach it made the cardinal feel so vengeful 
that he longed to go up and drum the sycamore with the woodpecker's head until he taught him how to treat his mate properly there was plenty of lark music rolling with the river and that morning brought the first liquid golden notes of the oreos they had arrived at dawn and were overjoyed with their homecoming for they were darting from bank to bank singing exquisitely on wing there seemed no end to the bird voices that floated with the river and yet there was no beginning to the one voice for which the cardinal waited with passionate longing the oreo's singing was so inspiring that it tempted the cardinal to another effort and perching where he gleamed crimson and black against the april sky he tested his voice and when the sure of his tones he entreatedly called come here come here just then he saw her she came daintily over the earth soft as down before the wind a rosy flush suffused her plumage a coral beak her very feet pink the shyest most timid little thing alive her bright eyes were popping with fear and down there among the ferns anemones and last year's dried leaves she tilted her sleek crested head and peered at him with frightened wonder and silent helplessness it was for this the cardinal had waited hoped and planned for many days he had rehearsed what he conceived to be every point of the situation and yet he was not prepared for the thing that suddenly happened to him he had expected to reject many applicants before he selected one to match his charms but instantly the shy little creature slipping along near earth taking a surreptitious peek at him made him feel a very small bird and he certainly never before had felt small the crushing possibility that somewhere there might be a cardinal that was larger brighter and a finer musician than he staggered him and worst of all his voice broke suddenly to his complete embarrassment half screened by the flowers she seemed so little so shy so delightfully sweet he chirped carefully once or twice to steady himself and clear his throat for unaccountably it had grown dry and husky and then he tenderly tried again come here come here implored the cardinal he forgot all about his dignity he knew that his voice was trembling with eagerness and hoarse with fear he was afraid to attempt approaching her but he leaned toward her begging and pleading he teased and insisted and he did not care a particle if he did it suddenly seemed an honor to coax her he rocked on the limb he sidestepped and hopped and gyrated gracefully he fluffed and flirted and showed himself to every advantage it never occurred to him that the dove and the woodpecker might be watching though he would not have cared in the least if they had been and as for any other cardinal he would have attacked the combined forces of the limberlost and rainbow bottom he sang and sang every impulse of passion in his big crimson palpitating body was thrown into those notes but she only turned her head from side to side peering at him seeming sufficiently frightened to flee at a breath and answered not even the faintest little chook of encouragement the cardinal rested a second before he tried again that steadied him and gave him better command of himself he could tell that his notes were clearing and growing sweeter he was improving perhaps she was interested there was some encouragement in the fact that she was still there the cardinal felt that his time had come come here come here was on his mettle now surely no cardinal could sing fuller clearer sweeter notes he began at the very first and rollicking through a story of adventure coloring it with every wild dashing catchy note he could improvise he followed that with a rippling song of joy and fullness of spring in notes as light and airy as the wind-blown soul of melody and with swaying body kept time to his rhythmic pressures then he glided into a song of love and tenderly pleadingly passionately told the story as only a courting bird can tell it 
then he sang a song of ravishment a song quavering with fear and the pain tugging at his heart he almost had run the gamut and she really appeared as if she intended to flee rather than come to him he was afraid to take even one timid little hop toward her in a fit of desperation the cardinal burst into the passion song he arose to his full height leaned toward her with outspread quivering wings and crest flaring to its utmost and rocking from side to side in the intensity of his fervor he poured out a perfect torrent of palpitant song his cardinal body swayed to the rolling flood of his ecstatic notes until he appeared like a flaming pulsing note of materialized music as he entreated coaxed commanded and pled from sheer exhaustion he threw up his head to round off the last note he could utter he breathlessly glanced down to see if she were coming caught sight of a faint streak of grey in the distance he had planned so to subdue the little female he courted that she would come to him he was in hot pursuit a half a day's journey away before he remembered it no other cardinal ever endured such a chase as she led him in the following days through fear and timidity she had kept most of her life in the underbrush the cardinal was a bird of the open fields and treetops he loved to rock with the wind and speed arrow-like in the great plunges of flight this darting and twisting over logs among leaves and through tangled thickets tired tried and exasperated him more than hundreds of miles of open flight sometimes he drove her from cover and then she wildly dashed uphill and down dale seeking another thicket but wherever she went the cardinal was only a breath behind her and with every passing mile his passion for her grew there was no time to eat bathe or sing only mile after mile of unceasing pursuit it seemed that the little creature could not stop if she would and as for the cardinal he was in that chase to remain until his last heartbeat it was a question how the frightened bird kept in advance she was visibly the worst for this ardent courtship two tail feathers were gone and there was a broken one beating from her wing once she had flown too low striking her head against a rail until a drop of blood came and she cried pitifully several times the cardinal had cornered her and tried to hold her by a bunch of feathers and compel her by force to listen to reason but she only broke from his hold and dashed away a stricken thing leaving him half dead with longing and remorse but no matter how baffled she grew or where she fled in her headlong flight the one thing she always remembered was not to lead the cardinal into the punishment that awaited him in rainbow bottom panting for breath quivering with fear longing for well-concealed retreats worn and half blinded by the disasters of flight through strange country the tired bird beat her aimless way but she would have been torn to pieces before she would have led her magnificent pursuer into the wrath of his enemies poor little feathered creature she had been fleeing some kind of danger all her life she could not realize that love and protection had come in this splendid guise and she fled on and on once the cardinal arcing with passion and love fell behind that she might rest and before he realized that another bird was close an impudent big relative of his straying from the limberloss entered the race and pursued her so hotly that with a note of utter panic she wheeled and darted back to the cardinal for protection when to the rush of rage that possessed him at the sight of a rival was added the knowledge that she was seeking him in her extremity such a mighty wave of anger swept the cardinal that he appeared twice his real size like a flaming brand of vengeance he struck that limber lost upstart and sent him rolling to the earth a mass of battered feathers with beak and claw he made his attack and when he so utterly demolished his rival 
that he hopped away trembling with dishevelled plumage stained with his own blood the cardinal remembered his little love and hastened back confidently hoping for his reward she was so securely hidden that although he went searching calling pleading he found no trace of her the remainder of that day the cardinal almost went distracted and his tender imploring cries would have moved any except a panic-stricken bird he did not even know in what direction to pursue her night closed down and found him in a fever of love sick fear but it brought rest and wisdom she could not have gone very far she was too worn he would not proclaim his presence soon she would suffer past enduring for food and water he hid in the willows close where he had lost her and waited with what patience he could and it was a wise plan shortly after dawn moving stilly at the break of day trembling with fear she came slipping to the river for a drink it was almost brutal cruelty but her fear must be overcome some way and with a cry of triumph the cardinal in a plunge of flight was beside her she gave him one stricken look and dashed away the chase began once more and continued until she was visibly breaking there was no room for a rival that morning the cardinal flew abreast of her and gave her a crest or attempted a kiss whenever he found the slightest chance she was almost worn out her flights were wavering and growing shorter the cardinal did his utmost if she paused to rest he crept close as he dared and piteously begged come here come here when she took wing he so dexterously intercepted her course that several times she found refuge in his sumac without realizing where she was and when she did that he perched just as closely as he dared and while they both rested he sang to her a soft little whispered love song deep in his throat and with every note he gently edged nearer she turned her head from him and although she was panting for breath and palpitant with fear the cardinal knew that he dared not go closer or she would dash away like the wild thing she was the next time she took wing she found him so persistently in her course that she turned sharply and fled panting to the sumac when this had happened so often that she seemed to recognize the sumac as a place of refuge the cardinal slipped aside and spent all his remaining breath in an exultant whistle of triumph for now she was beginning to see his way he dashed into mid-air and with a gyration that would have done credit to a flycatcher he snapped up a gadfly that should have been more alert with a tender chip from branch to branch slowly cautiously he came with it because he was half starved himself he knew that she must be almost famished holding it where she could see he hopped toward her eagerly carefully the gadfly in his beak his heart in his mouth he stretched his neck and legs to the limit as he reached the fly toward her what matter that she took it with a snap and plunged a quarter of a mile before eating it she had taken food from him that was the beginning cautiously he impelled her toward the sumac with untiring patience kept her there the remainder of the day he caressed her he carried her every choice morsel he could find in the immediate vicinity of the sumac and occasionally she took a bit from his beak though oftenest he was compelled to lay it on a limb beside her at dusk she repeatedly dashed toward the underbrush but the cardinal with endless patience and tenderness maneuvered her to the sumac until she gave up beneath the shelter of a neighboring grapevine perched on a limb that was the cardinal's own chosen resting place tucked her tired head beneath her wing and went to rest when she was soundly sleeping the cardinal crept as closely as he dared and with one eye on his little gray love and the other roving for any possible danger he spent a night of watching for danger that might approach 
it was almost worn out but this was infinitely better than the previous night at any rate for now he not only knew where she was but she was fast asleep in his own favorite place huddled on the limb the cardinal gloated over her he found her beauty perfect to be sure she was disheveled but she could make her toilet there were a few feathers gone but they would grow speedily she made a heart satisfying picture on which the cardinal feasted his love-sick soul by the light of every stray moonbeam that slid around the edges of the grape leaves wave after wave of tender passion shook him in his throat half the night he kept softly calling to her come here come here next morning when the robins announced day beside the shining river she awoke with a start but before she could decide in which direction to fly she discovered a nice fresh grub laid on a limb close to her and very sensibly remained for breakfast then the cardinal went to the river and bathed he made such a delightful play of it and the splash of the water sounded so refreshing to the tired draggled bird that she could not resist venturing for a few dips when she was wet she could not fly well and he improved the opportunity to pull her broken quills help her dress herself and bestow a few extra caresses he guided her to his favorite place for a sun bath and followed the farmer's plough in the cornfield until he found a big sweet beetle he snapped off its head peeled the stiff wing shields and daintily offered it to her he was so delighted when she took it from his beak and remained in the sumac to eat it that he established himself on the adjoining thorn bush where the snowy blossoms of a wild morning glory made a fine background for his scarlet coat he sang with the old pleading song as he never had sung it before for now there was a tinge of hope battling with the fear in his heart over and over he sang rounding fulling swelling every note leaning toward her in coaxing tenderness flashing his brilliant beauty as he swayed and rocked for her approval and all that he had suffered and all that he had hoped for was in his song just when his heart was growing sick within him his straining ear caught the faintest most timid call a lover ever answered only one imploring gentle chook from the sumac his song broke in a suffocating burst of exultation cautiously he hopped from twig to twig toward her with tender throaty murmurings he slowly edged nearer and wonders of wonders with tired eyes and quivering wings she reached him her beak for a kiss at dinner that day the farmer said to his wife maria if you want to hear the prettiest singin' and see the cutest sight you ever saw just come down along the line fence and watch the antics all that redbird we been hearin i don't know as redbirds are so scarce at dives any call to wade through slush a half a mile to see one answered maria footing's pretty good along the line fence said abram and you never saw a redbird like this fellow he's as big as two common ones he's so red every bush he lights on looks like it was a fire it's past all question he's been somebody's pet and he's taken me for the man i can get in six feet of him easy he's the finest bird i ever set eyes on and as for singin he's dropped the weather and he's askin folks to his house warmin to-day he's been there alone for a week and his singin's been first class but to-day he picked up a mate and he's tickled as ever i was i'm really consarned for fear he'll burst himself maria sniffed course don't come if you're tired honey said the farmer i thought maybe you'd enjoy it he's a doin me a power o good my joints are limbered up till i catch myself pretty near runnin on the furrows and then down towards the fence i'll go slow so's to stay near him as long as i can maria stared abram johnson 
have you gone daft she demanded abram chuckled not a mite dafter than ye'd be honey once ye'd set eyes on the feller better come if you can you're invited he's askin the whole endurin country to come maria said nothing more but she mentally decided she had no time to fool with a bird when there was housekeeping and spring sewing to do as she recalled abram's enthusiastic praise of the singer and had a whiff of the odor-laden air as she passed from kitchen to spring house she was compelled to admit that it was a temptation to go but she finished her noon work and resolutely sat down with her needle she stitched industriously her thread straightening with a quick nervous sweep learned through the years of experience and if her eyes wandered riverward she paused frequently with a rested hand and listened intently she did not realize it by two o'clock a spirit of unrest that demanded recognition had taken possession of her setting her lips firmly a scowl clouded her brow she stitched on by half past two her hands dropped in her lap abram's new hickory shirt slid to the floor and she hesitantly arose and crossed the room to the closet from which she took her overshoes and set them by the kitchen fire to have them ready in case she wanted them pshaw she muttered i got this shirt to finish this afternoon there's butter and bacon in the morning and mary jane sims is coming for a visit in the afternoon she returned to the window and took up the shirt sewing with unusual swiftness for the next half hour but by three she dropped it and opened the kitchen door gazed toward the river every intoxicating delight of early spring was in the air the breeze that fanned her cheek was laden with subtle perfume pollen and the crisp fresh odor of unfolding leaves curling skyward like a beckoning finger went a spiral of violet and gray smoke from a log heap abram was burning and scattered over spaces of a mile were half a dozen others telling a story of activity to his neighbors like the low murmur of distant music came the beating wings of hundreds of her bees rimming the water trough insane with thirst on the woodpile the guinea cock clattered incessantly put back put back across the door yard came the old turkey gobbler with fan tail and rasping scrap of wing evincing his delight in spring and mating time by a series of explosive snorts on the barnyard gate the old shanghai was lustily challenging to mortal combat one of his kind three miles across country from the river arose the stringent scream of her blue gander jealously guarding his harem in the poultry yard the hens made a noisy clackling party and the stable lot was filled with cattle bellowing for the freedom of the pasture and yet scarcely ready for grazing it seemed to the little woman hesitating in the doorway as if all nature had entered into a conspiracy to lure her from her work and just then clear and impetuous arose the demand of the cardinal come here come here blank amazement filled her face as i'm a living woman she gasped he's changed his song that's what abram meant by me being invited he's asked folks to come see his mate i'm going the dull red of excitement sprang into her cheeks she hurried on her overshoes and drew an old shawl over her head she crossed the dooryard followed the path through the orchard and came to the lane below the barn she turned back and attempted to cross the mud was deep and thick and she lost an overshoe but with the help of a stick she pried it out and replaced it joke on me if i'd a tumbled over in this mud she muttered she entered the barn and came out a minute later carefully closing and buttoning the door and started down the line fence toward the river halfway across the field abram saw her coming no need to recount how often he had looked in that direction during the afternoon 
He slapped the lines on the old gray's back and came tearing down the slope, his eyes flashing, his cheeks red, his hands firmly gripping the plow that rolled up a black mold as he passed. Maria stared at his flushed face and shining eyes, recognized that his whole being proclaimed an inward exultation. Abram Johnson, she solemnly demanded, have you got the power? Yes, cried Abram, pulling off his old felt hat and gazing into the crown as if for inspiration. You said it, honey. I got the power. Got it of a little red bird. Power of spring. Power of song. Power of love. And if that poor little red target for some ordinary cuss's bullet can get all he's getting out of life today, there's no cause why a thinking man shouldn't realize some of his blessings. You hit it, Maria. I got the power. It's the power of God, but I learned how to lay hold of it from that little red bird. Come here, Maria. Abram wrapped the lines around the plow handle and cautiously led his wife to the fence. He found a piece of thick bark for her to stand on and placed her where she would be screened by a big oak. And then he stood behind her and pointed out the sumac of the female bird. Just to keep still a minute and you'll feel paid for coming all right, honey, he whispered, but don't make any sudden movement. I don't know if I ever saw a worse-looking specimen as she is, answered Maria. She looks first class to him. There's no kick coming on his part, I can tell you, replied Abram. The bride hopped shyly through the sumac. She pecked at the dried berries and frequently tried to improve her plumage, which certainly had been badly draggled, and there was a drop of blood dried at the base of her beak. She plainly showed the effects of her rough experience, and yet she was a most attractive bird, for the dimples in her plump body showed through the feathers, and instead of unusual wickedly black eyes of the cardinal family, hers were a soft, tender brown, touched by a love light. There was no mistaking. She was a beautiful bird and she was doing all her power to make herself dainty again. Her movements indicated how timid she was, and yet she remained in the sumac, as if she feared to leave it, and frequently peered expectantly among the treetops. There was a burst of exultation down the river. The little bird gave her plumage a fluff and watched anxiously. On came the cardinal like a flaming rocket, calling to her on wing, he alighted beside her, dropping into her beak a morsel of food, gave her a kiss to aid digestion, caressingly ran his beak the length of her wing quills, and flew to the dogwood. Mrs. Cardinal enjoyed the meal. It struck her palate exactly right. She liked the kiss and caress, cared, in fact, for all that he did for her, and with the appreciation of his tenderness, came repentance for the dreadful chase she had led him in her foolish fright and an impulse to repay she took a dainty hop toward the dogwood and the invitation she sent him was exquisite with a shrill whistle of exultant triumph the cardinal answered at a headlong rush the farmer's grip tightened on his wife's shoulder but Maria turned toward him with blazing, tear-filled eyes. "'And you call yourself a decent man, Abram Johnson?' "'Decent?' quavered the astonished Abram. "'Decent? I believe I am.' "'I believe you ain't,' hotly retorted his wife. "'You don't know what decency is if you go peeking at them. "'They ain't birds. They're folks!' "'Maria!' pled Abram. "'Maria, honey!' I'm plumb ashamed of you, broke in Maria. How do you suppose she'd feel if she knew there'd be a man here peeking at her? Ain't she got the right to be loving and tender? Ain't she got the right to pay him best she knows? They're just common human beings, and I don't know 
where you got the privilege to spy on a female when she's doing the best she knows maria broke from his grasp and started down the fence line in a few strides abram had her in his arms his withered cheek with its springtime bloom pressed against her equally withered tear-stained one maria he whispered waveringly maria honey i wasn't meaning any disrespect to the sex maria wiped her eyes on the corner of her shawl i don't suppose you was abram she admitted but you're just like all the rest of men you never think now go on with your plowin and let the little female alone she unclasped his arms and turned homeward honey called abram softly since you brought him that pocket full o wheat you might as well let me have it landy exclaimed maria blushing i plumb forgot my wheat i thought maybe being so early picking was scarce and if you put out a little wheat and a few crumbs they'd stay a nest in the sumac as you're so fond of them just what i'm fairly praying they'll do and i've been carrying stuff and pettin him up the best i knowed for a week said abram as he knelt and cupped his shrinking hands while maria guided the wheat from her apron into them i'll scatter it along the top rail and they'll be after it in fifteen minutes thank you maria twas good of you to think of it maria watched him steadily how dear he was how dear he always had been how happy they were together abram she asked hesitantly is there anything else i could do for your birds there were creatures of habitual repression and the inner glimpses they had taken of each other that day were surprises they scarcely knew how to meet abram said nothing because he could not he slowly shook his head and turned to the plow his eyes misty maria started toward the line fence but she paused repeatedly to listen and it was no wonder for all the redbirds from miles down the river had gathered around the sumac to see if there were a battle in berlin but it was only the cardinal turning somersaults in the air and screaming with bursting exuberance come here come here end of chapter three Chapter Four of the Song of the Cardinal by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. So dear, so dear, crooned the cardinal. She had taken possession of the sumac. The location was her selection, and he loudly applauded her choice. She placed the first twig, and after examining it carefully, he spent the day carrying her others just as much alike as possible. If she used a dried grass blade, he carried grass blades until she began dropping them on the ground. If she worked in a bit of wild grapevine bark, he peeled grapevines until she would have no more. It never occurred to him that he was the largest cardinal in the woods. In those days, he had forgotten that he wore a red coat. She was not a skilled architect. Her nest certainly was a loose, ramshackled affair but she had built it, and had allowed him to help her. It was hers, and he improvised a pean in its praise. Every morning he perched on the edge of the nest and gazed in songless wonder at each beautiful new egg, and whenever she came to brood, she sat as if entranced, eyeing her treasures in the ecstasy of proud possession. Then she nestled them against her warm breast and turned adoring eyes toward the cardinal. If he sang from the dogwood, she faced that way. If he rocked on the wild grapevine, she turned in her nest. If he went to the cornfield for grubs, she stood astride her eggs and peered down, watching his every movement with unconcealed anxiety. The cardinal forgot to be vain of his beauty. She delighted in it every hour of the day. Shy and timid beyond belief she had been during her courtship. 
but she made reparation by being an incomparably generous and devoted mate. The cardinal, he was astonished to find himself capable of so much and varied feeling. It was not enough that he brooded while she went to bathe and exercise. The daintiest of every morsel he found was carried to her. When she refused to swallow another particle, he perched on a twig close by the nest many times in a day, and with sleek feathers and lowered crest gazed at her in silent, worshipful adoration. Up and down the river bank he flamed and rioted. In the sumac he uttered not the faintest chip that might attract attention. He was so anxious to be inconspicuous that he appeared only half his real size. Always on leaving he gave her a tender little peck and ran his beak the length of her wing, a characteristic caress that he delighted to bestow on her. If he felt that he was disturbing her too often, he perched on the dogwood and sang for life and love and happiness. His music was in a minor key now. The high, exuberant, ringing notes of passion were mellowed and subdued. He was improvising cradle songs and lullabies. He was telling her how he loved her, how he would fight for her, how he was watching over her, how he would signal if any danger were approaching, how proud he was of her, what a beautiful nest she had built, how beautiful he thought her eggs, what magnificent babies they would produce. Full of tenderness, melting with love, liquid with sweetness, the cardinal sang to his patient little brooding mate, So dear, so dear. The farmer leaned on his corn planter and listened to him intently. I swiney, if he hasn't changed his song again, and this time I'm blessed if I can tell what he's saying. Every time the cardinal lifted his voice, the clip of the corn planter ceased, and Abram hung on the notes and studied them over. One night he said to his wife, Maria, have you been noticing the red bird of late? He's changed to a new tune, and this time I'm completely stalled. I can't for the life of me make out what he's saying. Suppose you step down tomorrow and see if you can catch it for me. I've give a pretty to know. Maria felt flattered. She always had believed that she had a musical ear. Here was an opportunity to test it and please Abram at the same time. She hastened her work the following morning, and very early slipped along the line fence. Hiding behind the oak, with straining ear and throbbing heart, she eagerly listened. Clip, clip, came the sound of the planter as Abram's dear old figure trudged up the hill. Chip, chip, came the warning of the cardinal as he flew to his mate. He gave her some food, stroked her wing, and flying to the dogwood, sang of the love that encompassed him. As he trilled forth his tender caressing strain, the heart of the listening woman translated as did that of the brooding bird. With shining eyes and flushed cheeks, she sped down the fence, panting and palpitating with excitement she met Abram halfway on his return trip. Forgetful of her habitual reserve, she threw her arms around his neck, and drawing his face to hers, she cried, Oh, Abram, I've got it, I've got it, I know what he's saying, oh, Abram, my love, my own, to me, so dear, so dear. So dear, so dear, echoed the cardinal. The bewilderment in Abram's face melted into comprehension. He swept Maria from her feet as he lifted his head. Oh, my soul, you have got it, honey. That's what he's saying, plain as gospel. I can tell it plainer than anything he's sung yet. Now I sense it. He gathered Maria in his arms, pressed her head against his breast with a trembling old hand, while the face he turned to the morning was beautiful. I wish to God, he said, quavering, at every creature on earth was as well fixed as me and the red bird. 
Clasping each other, they listened with rapt faces as, mellowing across the cornfield, came the notes of the cardinal, so dear, so dear. After that, Abram's devotion to his bird family became a mild mania. He carried food to the top rail of the line fence every day, rain or shine, with the same regularity that he curried and fed Nancy in the barn. From caring for and so loving the cardinal, there grew in his old tender heart a welling flood of sympathy for every bird that homed on his farm. He drove a stake to mark the spot where the killdeer hen brooded in the cornfield so that he would not drive Nancy over the nest. When he closed the bars at the end of the lane, he always was careful to leave the third one down, for there was a chippy brooding in the opening where it fitted when closed. Alders and sweetbriars grew in his fence corners, undisturbed that spring if he discovered that they sheltered an anxious-eyed little mother. He left a square yard of clover unmowed, because it seemed to him that the lark, singing nearer the throne than any other bird, was picking up stray notes dropped by the invisible choir, and with unequal purity and tenderness sending them ringing down to his brooding mate, whose home and happiness would be despoiled by the reaping of that spot of green. He delayed burning the brush heap from the spring pruning back of the orchard until fall, when he found it housed a pair of fine thrushes, for the song of the thrush delighted him almost as much as that of the lark. He left a hollow limb on the old red pearbane apple tree, because when he came to cut it there was a pair of bluebirds twittering around, frantic with anxiety. His pockets were bulgy with wheat and crumbs, and his heart was big with happiness. It was a golden springtime of his later life. The sky never seemed so blue, nor the earth so beautiful. The cardinal had opened the fountains of his soul. Life took on new color and joy, while every work of God manifested a fresh and heretofore unappreciated loveliness. His very muscles seemed to relax, and new strength arose to meet the demands of his uplifted spirit. He had not finished his day's work with such ease and pleasure in years, and he could see the influences of his rejuvenation in Maria. She was flitting around her house with broken snatches of song, even sweeter to Abram's ears than the notes of the birds, and in recent days he had noticed that she dressed particularly for her afternoon sewing, putting on her Sunday lace collar with a white apron. He immediately went to town and brought her a finer collar than she had ever owned in her life. Then he hunted a sign painter and came home bearing a number of pine boards on which gleamed in big, shiny black letters. No hunting allowed on this farm. He seemed slightly embarrassed when he showed them to Maria. I feel a mite unfriendly putting up signs like that for my neighbors, he admitted, but the fact is, it ain't the neighbors so much as it's the boys that need raisin, and them town creatures who call themselves sportsmen and kill a hummingbird to see if they can hit it. Times was when trees and underbrush were so full of birds and squirrels, any amount of rabbits, and the fish fairly crowding in the river. I used to kill all the quail and wild turkey about here a body needed to make an appetizing change. It was always my plan to take a little and leave a little, but just look at it now. Surprised in my life when I get a two-pound bass. Wild turkey's goblins would scare me most out of my senses, and as for the birds, there are just about a fourth of what they used to be, and the crops eaten to pay for it. I do all I'm trying to do for any bird cause of its song and color and pretty teeterin' ways, but I ain't so slow but to see that I'm paid in what they do for me. 
up go these signs and it won't be a happy day for anybody i catch trespassing on my birds maria studied the signs meditatively you shouldn't be forced to put them up she said conclusively if it's been decided at it's good for them to be here and laws made to protect em people ought to act with some sense and leave em alone i never was so interested in the birds in all my life and i'll just do a little looking out myself if you hear a paying of the old dinner bell when you're out in the field you know it means there's someone sneaking around with a gun abram caught maria and planted a resounding smack on her cheek where the roses of girlhood yet bloomed for him then he filled his pockets with crumbs and grains and strolled to the river to set the cardinal's table he could hear the sharp incisive chip and the tender mellow love notes as he left the barn and all the way to the sumac they rang in his ears the cardinal met him at the corner of the field and hopped over bushes and the fence only a few yards from him when abram had scattered his store on the rail the bird came tipping and tilting daintily caught up a crumb and carried it to the sumac his mate was pleased to take it and he carried her one morsel after another until she refused to open her beak for more he made a light supper himself and then swinging on the grapevine he closed the day with an hour of music he repeatedly turned a bright questioning eye towards abram but he never for a moment lost sight of the nest and the plump gray figure of his little mate as she brooded over her eggs he brooded over her and that she might realize the depth and consistency of his devotion he told her repeatedly with every tender inflection he could throw into his tones that she was so dear so dear the cardinal had not known that the coming of the mate he so coveted would fill his life with such unceasing gladness and yet on the very day that happiness seemed at his fullest measure there was trouble in the sumac he had overstayed his time chasing a fat moth he particularly wanted for his mate and she growing thirsty past endurance left the nest and went to the river seeing her there he made all possible haste to take his turn at brooding so he arrived just in time to see a pilfering red squirrel starting away with an egg with a vicious scream the cardinal struck him full force his rush of rage cost the squirrel an eye but it lost the father a birdling for the squirrel dropped the egg outside the nest the cardinal mournfully carried away the tell-tale bits of shell so that any one seeing them would not look up and discover his treasures that left three eggs and the brooding bird mourned over the lost one so pitifully that the cardinal perched close to the nest the remainder of the day and whispered over and over to comfort her so dear so dear End of chapter 4、chapter、five of the Song of the Cardinal by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. See here, see here, demanded the Cardinal. The mandate repeatedly rang from the topmost twig of the thorn tree, and yet the Cardinal was not in earnest. He was beside himself with a new and delightful excitement, and he found it impossible to refrain from giving vent to his feelings. He was commanding the farmer and every furred and feathered denizen of the river bottom to see. Then he fought like a wild thing if any of them ventured close, for great things were happening in the sumac. In past days, the cardinal had brooded an hour every morning while his mate. Went to take her exercise, bathe and fluff in the sun parlor. He had gone to her that morning as usual, and she looked at him with anxious eyes and refused to move. 
he hopped to the very edge of the nest and repeatedly urged her to go she only ruffled her feathers and nested the eggs she was brooded to turn them but did not offer to leave the cardinal reached over and gently nudged her with his beak to remind her that it was his time to brood but she looked at him almost savagely and gave him a sharp peck so that he knew she was not to be bothered he carried her every dainty he could find and hovered near her tense with anxiety it was late in the afternoon before she went after the drink for which she was half famished she scarcely had reached a willow and bent over the water before the cardinal was on the edge of the nest he examined it closely but he could see no change he leaned to give the eggs careful scrutiny and from somewhere there came to him the faintest little chip he had ever heard up went the cardinal's crest and he dashed to the willow there was no danger in sight and his mate was greedily dipping her rosy beak in the water he went back to the cradle and listened intently and again that feeble cry came to him under the nest around it and all through the sumac he searched until at last completely baffled he came back to the edge the sound was so much plainer there that he suddenly leaned caressing the eggs with his beak and then the cardinal knew he had heard the first faint cries of his shell in case babies with a wild scream he made a flying leap through the air his heart was beating to suffocation he started in a race down the river if he alighted on a bush he took only one swing and springing from it flamed on in headlong flight he flashed to the top of the tallest tulip tree and cried cloudward to the lark see here see here he dashed to the river bank and told the killdeers and then visited the underbrush and informed the thrushes and the wood robins father tender he grew so delirious with joy that he forgot his habitual aloofness and fraternized with every bird beside the shining river he even laid aside his customary caution went chipping into the sumac and caressed his mate so boisterously she gazed at him severely and gave his wing a savage pull to recall him to his sober senses that night the cardinal slept in the sumac very close to his mate and he shut only one eye at a time early in the morning when he carried her the first food he found that she was on the edge of the nest dropping bits of shell outside and creeping to peep he saw the tiniest coral baby with closed eyes and little patches of soft silky down its beak was wide open and though his heart was even fuller than the previous day the cardinal knew what that meant and instead of indulging in another celebration he assumed the duties of paternity and began searching for food for now there were two empty crops in his family on the following day there were four then he really worked how eagerly he searched and how gladly he flew to the sumac with every rare morsel the babies were too small for the mother to leave and for the first few days the cardinal was constantly on wing if he could not find sufficiently dainty food for them in the trees or bushes or among the offerings of the farmer he descended to earth in search like a wood robin he forgot he needed a bath or owned a sun parlor but everywhere he went from his full heart there constantly burst the cry see here see here his mate made never a sound her eyes were bigger and softer than ever and in them glowed a steady love light she hovered over those three red mites of nestlings so tenderly she was so absorbed in feeding stroking and coddling them she neglected herself until she became quite lean when the cardinal came every few minutes with food she was a picture of love and gratitude for his devoted attention and once she reached over and softly kissed his wing see here see here shrilled the cardinal and in his ecstasy he again forgot himself and sang in the sumac then he carried food with greater activity than ever to cover his lapse 
the farmer knew that it lacked an hour of noon but he was so anxious to tell maria the news that he could not endure the suspense another minute there was a new song from the sumac he heard it as he eagerly turned the first corner with the shovel plow he had listened eagerly and caught the meaning almost at once see here see here he tied the old gray mare to the fence to prevent her from eating the young corn and went immediately by leaning a rail against the thorn tree he was able to peer into the sumac and take a good look at the nest of the handsome birdlings now well screened with the umbrella-like foliage it seemed to abram that he never could wait until noon he critically examined the harness in the hope that he would find a buckle missing and tried to discover a flaw in the plow that would send him to the barn for a file but he could not invent an excuse for going so when he had waited until an hour of noon he could endure it no longer got news for you maria he called from the well where he was making a pretense of thirst oh i don't know answered maria with a superior smile if it's about the redbirds he's been up to the garden three times this morning yellin see here fit to spit and i just figured that their little ones had hatched is that your news well i be derned gasped the astonished abram mid-afternoon abram turned nancy and started the plow down a row that led straight to the sumac he intended to stop there tie to the fence and go to the river bank in the shade for a visit with the cardinal it was very warm and he was feeling the heat so much that in his heart he knew he would be glad to reach the end of the row and rest he had promised himself the quick nervous strokes of the dinner bell clang clang came cutting the air clearly and sharply abram stopped nancy with a jerk it was the warning maria had promised to send him if she saw prowlers with guns he shaded his eyes with his hand and scanned the points of the compass through narrow lids with concentrated vision he first caught a glimpse of light playing on a gun barrel and then he could discern the figure of a man clad in hunter's outfit leisurely walking down the lane toward the river abram hastily hitched nancy to the fence making the best time he could he reached the opposite corner and was nibbling the midrib of a young corn blade and placidly viewing the landscape where the hunter passed howdy he said in an even cordial voice the hunter walked on without lifting his eyes or making audible reply to abram's friendly old-fashioned heart this seemed the rankest discourtesy and there was a flash in his eyes and a certain quality in his voice he lifted a hand for parley hold a minute my friend he said since you are on my premises might i be privileged to ask you if you've seen a few signs i have posted pertaining the use of a gun i am not blind replied the hunter and my education has been looked after to the extent that i can make out your notices from the number and size of them i think i could do it old man if i had no eyes the scarcely suppressed sneer and the old man grated on abram's nerves amazingly for a man of sixty years of peace the gleam in his eyes grew stronger and there was a perceptible lift of his shoulders as he answered i mean him to be read and understood from the main road passin that cabin up there on the bank straight to the river and from the foremost line o this field to the same is my premises and on every foot of them the signs are in full force they're in a little fuller force in june when half the bushes and tufts of grass are housing a young bird family than at any other time they're sort of upholding the legislator act providing for the protection of game and singing birds and maybe it would be well for you to notice at i'm not so old am able to stand up for my right to any living man there certainly was an added tinge of respect in the hunter's tones 
as he asked, Would you consider it trespassing if a man simply crossed your land, following the line of the fences, to reach the farm of a friend? Certainly not, cried Abram, cordial in his relief. To be sure not. Glad to have you convenience yourself. I only want to just call to your notice at the birds are protected on this farm. I have no intention of interfering with your precious birds, I assure you, replied the hunter, and if you require an explanation of the gun in June, I confess I did hope to be able to pick off a squirrel for a very sick friend, but I suppose for even such a cause it would not be allowed on your premises. Oh, pshaw, now, said Abram, man alive, I'm not unreasonable. Of course, in a case of sickness, I'd be glad if you'd run across a squirrel. All I want to do is have a clear understanding about the birds. Good luck and good day to you. Abram started across the field to Nancy, but he repeatedly turned to watch the gleam of the gun barrel as the hunter rounded the corner and started down the river bank. He saw him leave the line of the fence and disappear in the thicket. Going straight for the sumac, muttered Abram. It's likely I'm a fool for not staying right beside him past that point, and yet I made it fair and plain, and he passed his word that he wouldn't touch the birds. He untied Nancy and for the second time started toward the sumac. He had been plowing carefully, his attention divided between the mare and the corn, but he uprooted half that row, for his eyes wandered to the cardinal's home as if he were fascinated, and his hands were shaking with undue excitement as he gripped the plow handles. At last he stopped Nancy, and stood gazing eagerly toward the river. It must be just about the sumac, he whispered. Lord, but I'll be glad to see the old gun barrel gleaming safe to the other side of it. There was a thin puff of smoke, and a screaming echo went rolling and reverberating down the Wabash. Abram's eyes widened, and a curious whiteness settled on his lips. He stood as if incapable of moving. Clang, clang, came Maria's second warning. The trembling slid from him, and his muscles hardened. There was no trace of rheumatic stiffness in his movements. With a bound, he struck the chain traces from the single tree at Nancy's heels. He caught the hames, leaped on her back, and digged his heels into her side. He stretched along her neck like an Indian and raced across the cornfield. Nancy's twenty years had slipped from her, as her master's sixty had from him. Without understanding the emergency, she knew that he required all the speed there was in her. With the trace trains rattling and beating on her heels, she stretched out until she fairly swept the young corn as she raced for the sumac. Once Abram straightened and slipped a hand into his pocket, drew out a formidable jackknife, opening it as he rode. When he reached the fence, he almost flew over Nancy's head. He went into a fence corner, and with a few slashes, severed a stout hickory wythe, stripping the leaves and topping it as he leaped the fence. He grasped this ugly weapon, his eyes dark with anger as he appeared before the hunter, who supposed him at the other side of the field. Did you shoot at that redbird? he roared. As his gun was at the sportsman's shoulder, and he was still peering among the bushes, denial seemed useless. Yes, I did, he replied, and made a pretense of turning to the sumac again. There was a forward impulse of Abram's body. Hit him? he demanded with awful calm. Thought I had, but I guess I only winged him. Abram's fingers closed around his club. At the sound of his friend's voice, the cardinal came darting through the bushes, a wavering flame, and swept so closely to him for protection that a wing almost brushed his cheek. See here, see here, shrilled the bird in deadly panic. There was not a cut feather on him. Abram's relief was so great that he seemed to shrink an inch in height. Young man, you better thank your God. You miss that bird, he said solemnly, for if you'd a killed him, I'd a mawed the stick to ribbons. 
on you and i'm most afraid i wouldn't a knowed it then when to quit he advanced a step in eagerness as the hunter mistaking his motive leveled his gun drop that shouted abram as he broke through the bushes that clung to him tore the clothing from his shoulder as he broke through the bushes that clung to him and tore the clothing from his shoulders and held him back drop that don't you dare point a weapon at me on my own premises and after you passed your word your word repeated abram with withering scorn his white quivering old face terrible to see young man i've got a couple things i'd like to say to you you're shaped like a man and you're dressed like a man and yet the smartest person living would take you for anything but an egg-sucking dog this minute all the time god ever spent on you was wasted and your mother had the same luck i suppose god's used to having creatures and he's made go wrong but i pity your mother goodness knows a woman suffers and works enough over her children and then to fetch a boy to man's estate and have him of his own free will and accord to be a liar young man truth is the cornerstone of the temple of character nobody can put up a good building without a solid foundation and you can't do a solid character building with a lie at the base man that's a liar ain't fit for anything can't trust him in no spirit or relation of life or in any way shape or manner you passed out your word like a man and like a man i took it and went off trusting you and you failed me like as not that squirrel story was a lie too have you got a sick friend who is needin squirrel broth the hunter shook his head no that wasn't true either i'll own you make me curious would you mind tellin me what was your idea in cookin up that squirrel story the hunter spoke with effort i suppose i wanted to do something to make you feel small he admitted in a husky voice you wanted to make me feel small repeated abram wonderingly lord lord young men did you ever hear a boomerang it's a kind of weapon used in boreno or australia or some of them furian parts and it's so made at the heathens can pitch it and it cuts a circle and comes back to the fellow at throat i can't see myself and i don't know how small i'm looking but i'd rather lose ten o years of my life than to have anybody catch me looking as little as you do right now i guess we could look at the same way we feel in this world i'm feeling near the size of goliath at the present but your size is such that it hustles me to see any man in you at all and you wanted to make me feel small my oh my and you're so young yet too and if it hadn't a compass to matter of breaking your word what would you want to kill the red bird for anyhow who give you rights to go round taking such beauty and joy out of the world who do you think made this world and the things that's in it maybe it's your notion at somebody your size whittled from a block of wood scattered a little sand for earth stuck a few seeds for trees and started the oceans with a watering pot i don't know what paved streets and stall feedings do for a man but for any one at's livin sixty year on the ground knows at this whole old earth is just teemin with work and at's too big for anything but a god and a mighty big god at that you don't ever need to bother none about discoveries of science for if science don't prove at the earth was a red-hot slag broken from the sun at bald and cooled flying through space to the force of gravity caught it and held it it doesn't prove what the sun broke from or why it bald and didn't cool sky over your head earth under your foot trees around you and river there all full of life at you ain't no mortal right to touch cause god made it and it's his course i know he said distinct at a man was to have dominion over the beast or the fields and the fowls of the air and that means at you're free to smash a copperhead instead of letting it sting you means at you're better to shoot a wolf than to let it carry off your lambs 
means that it's right to kill a hawk to save your chickens but god knows at shootin' a red bird just to see feathers fly isn't havin' dominion over anything it's just makin' a plum beast o yourself passes me how you can face up to the almighty and draw a bead on a thing like that takes more gal than i got god never made anything prettier than that bird and he must have been proud of the job just cast your eyes on it there ever seen anything so runnin over with dainty pretty coaxin ways little red creatures full of history too ever think of that last year's bird hatched hereabout like as not went south for winter and made friends at's been feedin and teachin it to trust mankind back this spring in a night and struck that sumac over a month ago broke me all up first time i ever set eyes on it biggest reddest redbird i ever saw and just a master hand at king's english talk plain as you can don't know what he said down south but you can bank on it it was something pretty fine when he settled here he was discoursin on the weather and he talked it out about proper he said wet year wet year just like that he got the wet just as good as i can and if he drawed on the year out a little still any blockhead could a told what he was sayin', and in a voice just as clear as a bell then he got lovesick and begged for company until he broke me all up and if i'd been a hen redbird i wouldn't have been so long comin had me pulverized in less than no time then a little hen comes along and stops with him and twas like organ playin prayers to hear him tell her how he loved her now they got a nest full of the cunningest little topknot babies and he splittin the echoes callin for the whole neighborhood to come see him he's so mortal proud stakes my life he's never been fired on afore he's pretty near wild with nervousness but he's got too much spunk to leave his family and go off and hide from creatures like you there's no caution in him look at him tearin around you to give you another chance i felt too rheumatically to tackle field work this spring until he come along in the fire o his coat and spring got me warmed up and i ain't been in years work's gone like it was greased and my soul's been singin for joy a life and happiness every minute of the time since he come been carryin him grub to that top rail once and twice a day for the last month and i can go in three feet of him my wife comes to see him and brings him stuff and we about worship him who are you to come along and wipe out his joy in life and our joy in him for just nothing you'd a left him to rot on the ground if you'd hit him and me and maria loved him so did you ever stop to think how full this world is of things to love if your heart's just big enough to let em in we love to live for the beauty of things surrounding us and the joy we take in being among them and it's my belief at the way to make folks love us is for us to be able to precipitate what they can do if a man's puttin' his heart and soul and blood and a beefsteak and bones into paintin pictures you can talk farmin to him all day and he's dumb but just show him at you see what he's a drivin at in his work and he'll love you like a brother whatever anybody succeeds in it's success cuz they so love it at they put their best of themselves into it and so lovin what they do is lovin them it would about kill a painter man to put the best of himself into a picture and then have some fellow like you come along and pour your turpentine on it just to see the paint run and i think it must pretty well use god up to figure out how to make a color a thing like that bird and then to have you walk up and shoot the little red heart out of it just to prove that you can he's the very life of this river bank i'd as soon see you dig up the underbrush and dry up the river and spoil the picture they make against the sky 
as to have you drop the red bird he's a red life of the whole thing god must have made him when his heart was pulsin hot with love the lust of creatin incomparable things and he just saw how pretty it would be to dip his featherins into the blood he was puttin in his veins to my mind ain't no better way to love and worship god than to protect and precipitate these fine gifts he's given for our joy and use worshipin that board's a kind of religion to me gettin the beauty from the sky and the trees and the grass and the water a god made is nothin but doin him homage whole earth's a sanctuary you can worship from sky above to grass underfoot course each man has his particular altar mine's in that cabin up at the bend of the river maria lives there god never did cleaner work and when he made maria love and hers sacrament she's so clean and pure and honest and big-hearted in forty year i've never just durst brace right up to maria and try to put in words what she means to me never saw anything as beautiful or as good no flowers as fragrant and smelly as her hair on the pillow never tapped a bee tree with honey sweet as her lips a twitchin with a love quiver ain't a bird along the old wabash with a voice up to hers love of god ain't broader in her kindness when she's been home to see her folks i've been so hungry for her that i've gone to her closet and kissed the hem of her skirts more than once i've never yet dared kiss her feet but i've always wanted to i've laid out at the first she dies i'll do it then and maria would cry her eyes out if you would hit that redbird your trappings look like you could shoot i guess twas god that made that shot fly the mark i guess if you can stop for the love of mercy do it cried the hunter his face was sickly white his temples wet with sweat and his body trembling i can't endure any more i don't suppose you'd think i've any human instincts at all but i have a few and i see the way to arouse more you probably won't believe me but i'll never kill another innocent harmless thing and i'll never lie again so long as i live he leaned his gun against the thorn tree and dropped the remainder of his hunter's outfit beside it on the ground i don't seem a fit subject to have dominion he said i'll leave those things for you and thank you for what you've done for me there was a crash through the bushes a leap over the fence and abram and the cardinal were alone the old man sat suddenly on a fallen limb of the sycamore he was almost dazed with astonishment he held up his shaking hands and watched them wonderingly and then he cupped one over each trembling knee to steady himself he outlined his dry lips with the tip of his tongue and breathed in heavy gusts he glanced toward the thorn tree left his gun he hoarsely whispered and it's fine as a fiddle lock stock and barrel just a shinin and all that heap of leather fixins must a cost a lot o money said he wasn't fit to use em leapt the fence like a panther and cut dirt across the cornfield and left me a gun well 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 wonder what i said i must have been almost fierce see here see here showed the cardinal abram looked over him carefully he was quivering with fear but in no way injured my but that was a close call old fellow said abram a minute later and our fun would have been over and the summer just spoiled wonder if you knew what it meant and if you'll be gun shy after this land knows i hope so for a few more such doses you'd just lay me up he gathered himself together at last set the gun over the fence and climbed after it caught nancy who had feasted to plethora on young corn he fastened up the trace chains and climbed to her back laid the gun across his lap and rode to the barn he attended the mare with particular solicitude 
and bathed his face and hands in the water trough to make himself a little more presentable to maria he started to the house but had only gone a short way when he stopped and after standing in thought for a time he turned back to the barn and gave nancy another ear of corn after all it was you old girl he said patting her shoulder i never on earth could a made it on time afoot he was so tired he leaned for support against her for the unusual exertion and intense excitement were telling on him sorely and as he rested he confided to her i don't know as i ever in my life was so riled nancy i'm afraid i was a little mat fierce he exhibited the gun and told the story very soberly at supper time and maria was so filled with solicitude for him and the bird and so indignant at the act of the hunter that she never said a word about abram's torn clothing and the hours of patching that would ensue she sat looking at the gun and thinking intently for a long time and then she said pityingly i don't know just what you could have said that could make a man go off and leave a gun like that poor fellow i do hope abram you didn't come down on him too awful strong maybe he lost his mother when he was just a little tyke and he hasn't had much teaching abram was completely worn out and went early to bed far in the night maria felt him fumbling around her face in an effort to learn if she recovered and as he drew the sheet over her shoulder he muttered in worn and sleepy tones i'm afraid there's no use denying it maria i was just mortal fierce in the sumac the frightened little mother cardinal was pressing her precious babies close against her breast and all through the night she kept calling to her mate chook chook and was satisfied only when an answering chip came as for the cardinal he had learned a new lesson he had not been under fire before never again would he trust any one carrying a shining thing that belched fire and smoke he had seen the hunter coming and had raced home to defend his mate and babies thus making a brilliant mark of himself and he would not have deserted them only the arrival of the farmer had averted the tragedy in the sumac he did not learn to use caution for himself but after that if a gun came down the shining river he sent a warning cheep to his mate telling her to crouch low in the nest and keep very quiet and then in broken waves of flight with chirp and flutter he exposed himself until he lured danger from his beloved ones when the babies grew large enough for their mother to leave them a short time she assisted in food hunting and the cardinal was not so busy then he could find time frequently to mount to the top of the dogwood and cry to the world see here see here for the cardinal babies were splendid but his music was broken intermittent vocalizing now often uttered past a beak full of food and interspersed with spasmodic chips if danger threatened his mate and nestlings despite all their care it was not so very long until trouble came to the sumac and it was all because the first-born was plainly greedy much more so than either his little brother or his sister and he was one day ahead of them in strength he always pushed himself forward cried the loudest and longest and so took the greater part of the food carried to the nest and one day while he was still quite awkward and uncertain he climbed to the edge and reached so far that he fell he rolled down the river bank splash into the water and a hungry old pickerel sunning in the weeds finished him at a snap he made a morsel so fat sweet and juicy that the pickerel lingered close for a week waiting to see if there would be any more accidents the cardinal hunting grubs in the cornfield heard the frightened cries of his mate and dashed to the sumac in time to see the poor little ball of brightly tinted feathers disappear in the water and to hear the splash of the fish he called in helpless panic and fluttered over the spot he watched and waited until 
there was no hope of the nestling coming up then he went to the sumac to try to comfort his mate she could not be convinced that her young one was gone and for the remainder of the day filled the air with alarm cries and notes of wailing the two that remained were surely the envy of birdland the male baby was a perfect copy of his big crimson father only his little coat was gray but it was so highly tinged with red that it was brilliant and his beak and feet were really red and how his crest did flare and how proud and important he felt when he found he could raise and lower it at will his sister was not nearly so bright as he and she was almost as greedy as the lost brother with his father's chivalry he allowed her to crowd in and take most of the seeds and berries so that she continually appeared as if she could swallow no more yet she was constantly calling for food she took the first flight being so greedy she forgot to be afraid and actually flew to a neighboring thorn tree to meet the cardinal coming with food before she realized what she had done for once gluttony had its proper reward she not only missed the bite but she got her little self mightily well scared with popping eyes and fear flattened crest she clung to the thorn limb shivering at the depths below and it was the greatest comfort when her brother plucking up courage and came sailing across to her but of course she could not be expected to admit that when she saw how easily he did it she flared her crest turned her head indifferently and inquired if he did not find flying a very easy matter once he mustered the courage to try it and she made him very much ashamed indeed because he had allowed her to be the first to leave the nest from the thorn tree they worked their way to the dead sycamore but there the lack of foliage made them so conspicuous that their mother almost went into spasms from fright and she literally drove them back to the sumac the cardinal was so inordinately proud and made such a brave showing of teaching them to fly bathe and all other things necessary for young birds to know that it was a great mercy they escaped with their lives he mastered many lessons but he never could be taught to be quiet and conceal himself with explosive chips flaming and flashing he met dangers that sent all other birds beside the shiny water racing to cover concealment he scorned and repose he never knew it was a summer full of rich experience for the cardinal after these first babies were raised and had flown two more nests were built and two other broods flew from the sumac by fall the cardinal was the father of a small flock and they were each one neat trim beautiful river birds he had lived through spring with its perfumed air pale flowers and burning heart hunger he had known summer in its golden mood with forest pungent with spice bush and sassafras festooned with wild grapes woodbine and bittersweet carpeted with velvet moss and starry mandrake peeping from beneath green shades the never-ending murmur of the shining river the rich fulfillment of love's fruition now it was fall and all the promises of spring were accomplished the woods were glorious in autumnal tints there were ripened red haws black haws and wild grapes only waiting for severe frosts nuts rattling down scurrying squirrels and the rabbit's flash of gray and brown the waysides were bright with the glory of the goldenrod and royal with the purple of asters and iron wrought there was a rustling of falling leaves the flitting of velvety butterflies the whirl of wings trained southward and the call of the king crow gathering his followers then to the cardinal came the intuition that it was time to lead his family to the orange orchard one day they flamed and rioted up and down the shining river 
raced over the cornfield and tilted on the sumac the next a black frost had stripped its antlered limbs stark and deserted it stood a picture of loneliness o bird of wonderful plumage and human-like song what a precious thought of divinity to create such beauty and music for our pleasure brave songster of flaming coat too proud to hide your flashing beauty too fearless to be cautious of many dangers that beset you from the top of the morning we greet you and hail you king of birdland at your imperious command see here see here end of chapter five end of the song of the cardinal by jean stratton porter